are listening to the bomb hole. Bomb hole podcast. It's going to be very hot. It's going to be very uncomfortable for everybody. <laughs> the bomb hole. Gonna slide down in big hills. You know what I mean? On a big, nice burgundy snowboard. Okay, we are at it again. Another episode of the bomb hole, which is presented by Liquid Death and Pub Beer. Now, Stony Buds. First order of business, how we doing? So good, my dog. Always, always love hearing that. To my left, we have a great guest today. We have Mr. Dave Downing in the booth. Dave, what's happening? Hi, guys. We are so happy you're here. Uh, For the people that are unfamiliar, I'm just going to do a brief intro. You've been in the industry for over 32 years, started as a snowboard rep, then turned pro snowboarder, filmed over 24 video parts, helped develop products such as the Burton Custom, Burton split boards, still doing sales and marketing for, for Burton. And uh, you've basically just played a huge role in Snowbird's history. We're going to talk about all that. Uh, still, officially, you have no job title over at Burton. We'll get into that. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's there's so many things on the docket today. But I want to dive right in and start with the early days of your career. You know, you started as a snowboard rep and then, you know, eventually went on to turn pro, which is totally kind of ass backwards. Um you want to paint us a picture of what that period in your life was like? Yeah, it was a little different than most people, I think. Um, I was 21 years old when I started snowboarding, uh, 1990, and I just fell in love with it. I was a surfer in California. I worked at a surf shop, and one thing led to another. I started working for the Burton Rep in Southern California, and I was the Burton Rep, and I was riding Bear Mountain a lot. Or, yeah, I was Bear Mountain main, mainly, um, and that was the very beginning I, I think the years were 90 to 92, somewhere in there, Mike Perillo started building this snowboard park. It was called Outlaw Park back then, and it was, like, off to the side. And it's where basically all the snowboarders, they wanted to keep all the snowboarders over there corralled in this little space. And um, <clears throat> that was the snowboard park. And that's where I started getting into snowboarding a lot and riding there a lot. You know, um, Brian Thien was a riding buddy of mine, um, Brian Gucci. Uh, Rob Defoe, Todd Messick, all these guys riding Bear Mountain, and that's kind of where I really fell in love with it. Mm-hmm. And then, so how did you initially go on to get a job in the snowboard industry with Burton and things like that? Well, I uh, so I was a rep yep. um, for the Burton rep in Southern California, and um, one thing kind of led to another. It was kind of a weird thing, but I was a, a Burton rep, and the uh, team manager at the time, Eric Koch, um, hit me up one day and was like, hey, can you go to Europe? on this photo shoot, Cersei Wallace blew her knee out, can't go. And I was the rep at the time. I'm like, cause he rode with me at bear and I was into it, you know, and I guess I was getting good or whatever, but, um, I'm like, yeah, I've never been here before. I didn't even have a passport. So I got a passport, went on this trip and it was a trans world trip. And I met, uh, Jeff Curtis on that trip. I met my wife now, uh, Shannon Dunn on that trip, Tina Basich. Um, and it was just a crazy, life changing trip. Mm -hmm. So I come back from that trip and one thing led to another, but you know, I had an opportunity to go. I started like dating Shannon and she's filming with Mac dog and I was a burden rep. And I remember I was at the uh, trade show in Las Vegas at the time. And this was in March and she's like, Hey, come to Utah. And you know what, when you're done with the trade show, I'm like, cool. So I went to Utah and and uh, she was filming with Mac Dog, I think, for the Transworld Video Magazine stuff. And I think he was filming, yeah, it was TB3 at the time. And she's like, Mac Dog, can this guy Dave come out? And he's like, no, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, you can go out with this guy Kurt and this kid Peter. So I went out with Peter and Peter Line and um, Kurt Heine for a couple days. And it was right here in Utah. And mm-hmm. um, we just kind of went up and... I had no clue what I was doing, really. We were just building jumps, and Kurt's building these sick jumps, and Peter, this kid with his little hat on, is doing crazy flips stuff I've never seen before. And I was just trying to keep up and learn, and we were just having a great time. And then one thing led to another, and I went out the n- third day with Mac Dog, and Mac Dog and I kind of hit it off because we're kind of the same age, and he's like, whoa, what's up? And you're a surfer, and he liked to surf. And one thing led to another, and... We had a couple good days with Mac Dog, and then I remember he just like, dude, you got to go to Tahoe to film with Mike Hatchett. So I flew from Tahoe to, um, or from Utah to Tahoe, sorry. 
and met Mike Hatchett at Squaw and we started filming like with him and that was filming for the Transfer Video Magazine and for TV3. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how my like snowboard career went as far as being a pro snowboarder from being a Burton rep. Yeah. Unreal. Yeah. So a lot of it comes back to the, the relationships and, and who you meet. What were you going to say, bud? You just never hear about a rep mm -hmm. being coming a pro snowboarder, mm -hmm. right? Is that, I mean, it was different times back then yeah. for sure. It was, it's how, way, how way so, different. how so would you say like, um, it was more like innocent and kind of real and, it just was what it was. We, you could just go to a ski resort and just start hitting side hits and filming. Like, mm -hmm. it was that easy. How, how many, what was the ratio of skiers to snowboarder? Like, how, like there wasn't very many snowboarders. There wasn't, well, there was becoming many. a lot of snowboarders. That was right, right when it started happening. 90 yeah. to 95, was just blowing up. But <clears throat> there was a lot of pro snowboarders. Yeah. And um, it was just getting content and getting photos or getting, you know, magazines were huge, huge. And then the videos were all v VHS tapes and stuff. So it was like a totally different a lot of people listening to this might not even know what yeah. a VHS tape is, but yeah. <laughs> you know, we we're making these VHS videos that we're selling to the people. That's what, you know, Mac dog did standard films, uh, fall line films, all those companies, mm -hmm. they were making this VHS tape and selling it, <clears throat> you know? Um, so that's kind of how the culture was and the pro snowboarding thing. And, um, it was just more real, you know, mm -hmm. like nowadays it's just crazy. You know, I, I remember, I don't know what year it was, but I remember like Mac Dog first saying like, "That's not legit enough," you know. Like mm -hmm. we'd build the jump. He's like, "No, nah, let's not even film it." And I was like, "What? You, what do you mean?" You know, like because before that, you know, in the early '90s, it was just, it just was what it was, you know. Like, oh, that's sick, film it, and like, you know, look at even before that, like TB2. Like, you, if you watch Terry Ace part in TB2, it's like a four minute ender, and it was all filmed at Squaw Valley on the mountain run, mm -hmm. and it's sick. But it wasn't like this pre thought of like process of like building the biggest jump and the biggest thing and the big, it was just what it was. Go ride and film it. You can basically it film anywhere. Totally, huh? totally. And so it's changed a lot. You know? And yeah. one thing I know it's going to come up a lot, but the TB videos were standard that Mike mm -hmm. Hatchett made a mm -hmm. huge part in your career yep. and, and a humongous part of snowboard history. Mm -hmm. You know, even it's a little before mm -hmm. my time. And, and mm -hmm. so a lot of our listeners might not be familiar mm -hmm. with the, the TB stuff. So, so the TB, well, before I was even a pro snowboarder, Mike Hatchett made a movie called totally board and it was a kind of a big mountain board thing. And then Mac dog was making these gnarly freestyle videos, mm -hmm. hard to hungry and homeless, new kids in the talk. So they were kind of on two end of the end of the spectrum. <clears throat> and then they came together and did that movie TB2, which was Mac Dog and Mike Hatchett coming together and creating something at that time that hasn't really been done. And it was like the gnarliest big mountain stuff and the gnarliest freestyle stuff just moshed together. Mm -hmm. And it was like, holy moly, that was like nuts. So that's what TB movie started. Is It stands for Totally Bored. Mm -hmm. And then they just kept it on a roll, you know, TB2, TB3, TB4, blah, 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 you know. <clears throat> um, and then let me think about this. After TB5, I think, or 6, um, Mac Dog and Mike Hatchett split. Um, Mike Hatchett kept doing the TB movies. And Mike McIntyre, Mac Dog, um, started doing other full freestyle projects again and then all the forum stuff and yep. all that history too. So he went more just like hardcore freestyle mm -hmm. mind blowing stuff. And then my catch, it was still trying to, you know, have freestyle in there too, but more towards the big mountain type of free riding stuff. Well, I happen <laughs> to have a guest question from Mike Hatchett. Oh boy. Here we go. <laughs> hey guys, Mike Hatchett here. Got a question for Dave. Hey Dave, <clears throat> in the nineties, when a writer had a video part in one of the major movies, what was the impact like? And could a writer base their career off these video parts? Okay, first off, you got to hit all your horns, like on your thing yeah. right now. Like every one of them. Super air, get horn? The super air horn. <clears throat> Mike Hatchett deserves every horn you got. Like We got applause, too. You know, <laughs> just go off. <laughs> I'll answer the question, but first off, Mike Hatchett is just, every snowboarder needs to, like, understand how much effort and blood, sweat, and tears that guy's put into snowboarding. Um, I mean, people won't even, even if I talk about it, people won't understand it. But like 
the whole Alaska thing, free riding, flying around in helicopters, shooting, snowboarding, all that was him and his brother and a, f- a small group of people going out on a limb and just going for it, like with hardly any education and just going for it and then learn and just, it was huge back then. That was in the late eighties, early nineties. Um, and then I just got to give him props for everything that I kind of was as a snowboarder. He taught me, he mentored me. He, it was like a education process, you know, my whole life with him. Um, he's a great friend. I mean, really I've, I've talked about it before, but, um, people you spend a lot of time with and you can probably understand this, Chris, like you were filming with people, even in the city, like you're going through gnarly stuff and like, they're your homies for life. And Mike Hatchett, it's like a war person. It's like, I'm homies with Mike for mm-hmm. life. Like we've been through stuff and I just have the most respect for him for sure. Yeah. Um, that, there's a, there's a special bond with people you've been in the trenches with. Yeah, for sure. Know? But the question like, um, you know, I kind of answered it a little bit, but like, you know, the whole career was you went out and you filmed for six months out of the year and you're delivering this hopefully two minute package to, you know, make yourself whatever, uh, sponsored or paid, you know, your, your, your sponsors are paying you to go do this stuff, you know? And, you know, really I thought about that, all that stuff I did in filming was, I just wanted snowboarding to look fun and I wanted people to look at it and be inspired to do it. I kind of, I never really wanted to like do the gnarly stuff and be like, Oh my God, you're a hero. But, um, I was never like a risk taker, like the gnarliest thing. I just want to do the things that are the most fun and make it look fun. And if somebody watched me snowboard, I wanted them to be inspired to go do it because mm-hmm. I love the sport. I think it's awesome. It's a freedom of expression it's just a great thing. Um, so that's kind of what my career was, those video packages, you know, and like I said, it was like a VHS tape and then it went to a DVD and then it was digital. Um, one more thing like <laughs> regarding my gadget was a lot of people don't understand that back then it was 16 millimeter film. So Mike and all the filmers back then were filming these crazy huge cameras. His pack was like 80 pounds or something. And it was like these, they were loading film into this thing and we would never see the footage in my whole career. Basically like I never saw the footage. So you'd go film and then a month or two later he would get the film developed and then we'd go over to his house <laughs> in, in uh, Tahoe and we'd sit around in his living room and watch the footage. It was gnarly. Like Noah's there and Kevin Jones and they're just tearing into you like, Oh, that's sick. Oh, too bad you hand dragged or like the, your style sucks or just, mm-hmm. You're just sitting there going, oh, my gosh, dude, I'm getting torn apart by <laughs> Noah Slaznik, you know? Yeah. Like, it was it was pretty intense. Um, but I think it made all of us, like, better in a way because we would sit there and watch the footage and, like, we would all go out and want to make a better thing, you know? But it was, it was difficult not seeing the footage right away because I'm almost jealous of, you know, kids these days. They can see the footage right there and go, oh, they see it on their phone or whatever. And, like, oh, yeah, I, I got to do it again or whatever. But back then we didn't get to see that. Another thing to put in perspective too is like you got three minutes on a roll, so for sure. And so it's like if you you know each time you try something, it's twenty seconds or it's, what. It, it's ten bucks. He used to say that, dude. You're like you're just wasting money. Yeah. So if you don't, if you're not landing, it's yeah. not like it's like yeah, I'm gonna do a front three to land something yeah. because if I don't, you know, yeah. I can't just sit here and try this forty times to to get. The, you're the totally roll. right. Yeah. As soon as he pushed the button, you, it's just like money going out the window, you mm-hmm. know. So it was a different time for sure. But it also something about shooting film is timeless where it's, it's weird how it's like, it doesn't, it, it ages really well. It, it like, it doesn't, you know, you look at, um, you know, some old digi footage and it, it doesn't have the same, ex- same effect mm-hmm. as yeah. 16 millimeter yep. with yep. the film burn and everything For sure. like that. Yeah. Like Mac dog stuff. Like, gosh, you look at some of that. It's just like hard to hunger and homeless and stuff. It's just, you no, know, it's so gnarly mm-hmm. to me. So, and, and I think part, one part of his question is just basically making a living filming parts, right? Yeah. I mean, that was it. It was six months out of the year. Like I said, it was like, you just started in November or December, you know, and I used to just kind of ignore people until end of April, May, because you just had to just go and go and go and go and go, go, you know, to do that. 
And a lot of people, like, they just see the two minutes or three minutes of video part and they go, oh, that was a sick part, or, oh, your part's not that good this year, or whatever. And they didn't understand, like, all the trials and tribulations you went through for six months, the weeks on end of, you know, being shut down with weather, building jumps that don't work, you know, getting injured, getting stuck on snowmobiles, and every, just all kinds of drama. They don't ever see that. They just saw the two minutes, and they kind of judge you on, like, your two minutes. <laughs> so that's what my career was for, you know, 15 years. Also getting photos and magazines and stuff like that, which was pretty cool. You know, like Ethan, you're a big part of that, you yeah. know, just taking photos and, you know, just that art form of like going to document some image of a thing, whether it's a handrail or a cliff jump or whatever. It was like, that was really fun, you know, I'd like to do that. And that's all you guys had. They didn't have Instagram or all these yeah. other outlets. It was magazines, videos. and Well, you was... didn't even have digital. It, yeah. it, was, just, it was just, you know, like, the f even the photos were like you had to go to the, the um yeah we would shoot film and how'd you do it yeah I we mean, had to get them processed and we wouldn't see them until it was developed and every roll cost money so if you're shooting sequence you just throw that over your shoulder if someone didn't land yeah it's so different you yeah. Know? yeah you'd have to like really be in touch with the rider mm -hmm. like what trick are you doing do yeah. you shoot a sequence yeah. or not because yeah. now you can just shoot frame after mm -hmm. frame. It doesn't matter, yeah. But it it's cool so now. Like, I, I think it's cool. Like, the, yeah. I'm not opposed to the digital thing at all. Like, yeah, it's, it's, just, it's different. just different. You know, like Instagram and quick instant thing. It's just a different world we live in, you know. It and, was harder for new riders back in the day, I'm sure, though, because a filmer wasn't as quick to work with them if they didn't oh, know yeah, if they were going to land. Know, yeah, you, you can't make yeah. your own destiny in that way yeah. as much, right? Because you, you really to have filmer. to know, like, all right, is this guy worth it? Is he going to mm -hmm. land his tricks and? Yeah. And now you can just shoot anything that moves and right. decide later. <laughs> right. Yeah, a lot of, like, in standard films, a lot of people would get kind of cut, you know, like, because sponsors are sponsoring the movie, and they're putting writers in the movie, and they're trying. I remember Mike just going, hey, this guy's not going to work out, dude. I've been filming for two months, and he has one shot. Sorry. Not going to work. And that happens, you know. <laughs> okay, while we're on the subject of uh, standard films, Mike Hatchet, all that, I have another great surprise guest question. Uh from some family members years. What's up, Bomb Hall? It's Dylan and Logan Downing, and we wanna ask our dad a question. So you always tell us stories about um, having fun with the hatchets in the backcountry. What's your funnest moment with Spike and Axeman? Oh my God, they, he, know, he knows our nicknames. Um, <laughs> so Spike is Mike Hatchet, and Axeman is Dave Hatchet. Um, Gosh, phenomenal nicknames. Yeah, yeah those right. Are some nicknames. They're not it's because they're gnarly. <laughs> yeah. They're they're gnarly guys. Um the funnest moment, um I'll just say is last year, dude, last winter. You know, my, I got to ride a lot with them last last year and just being back with them in the backcountry and it was like the coolest thing. Like they're so frothing to ride and film and cool, do things and they're just like they were before. So that's probably the, just that comes to my mind. Cause last year it was really cool that I wrote with them a lot. Uh, Mike Hatchett filmed some stuff for Burton with me and it was really cool. Um, just to be back doing that. So that's what sticks in my mind. But, um, another moment I would say was just my first year to Alaska and this could be a whole nother podcast, but it was, uh, TB five and it was with, um, it was me and, uh, Johan Olofsson and Victoria Jalous and Mike and Dave Hatch were up there too. And that whole two week trip, it was 14 days and we had, I think it was 13 days of sun. Holy shit. And it was just like, I get goosebumps thinking about it. Cause it was just crazy. We flew in, the storm just ended and we had 13 days of blue sky, stable conditions. And it was just insane. And Mike and Dave were just, you know, so um awesome to coach and mentor me in that whole process and that trip uh, it was just those are the, the coolest days for sure that was your first trip that was my first trip um i forget what year it was, it was probably like 95 or 6 and that was with johan like i said yeah. and victoria Jalous. so we were kind of like the new ones and then the other heli was i think it was it was tex davenport for sure um Tom Burt and I think Matt Goodwill. Wow. So it was like these gnarly dudes. And yeah. I was like, these guys are like men, you know, like whole 
like gnarly. And, and then there's our, me and Johan. For our listeners, you never get 13 days of sun. Yeah, you so. might get one day of sun. <laughs> yeah, that's well, I, yeah, I've been back there many times, and it was like, uh, you never get that. Yeah, you so never I, get I that. I had no idea. You must have burned some serious budget on that. Yeah, I, and that was back then when it was like. When it was you, flowing. You could just go, right? <laughs> yeah. And it was just like, wow, this is the best thing ever. This is amazing, you know. Mm-hmm. A huge eye-opening experience, you know. Um, and then Johan Olofsson, if, if people don't know about him, look him up. But he's probably the the gnarliest snowboarder I ever got to see with my own eyes. Sick. A lot of gnarly, gnarly stuff go down. And the Alaska trip was crazy. I'll, I'll give you a little context. So he was this kid from uh, Sweden, full freestyle ripper. He used to ride switch in the half pipe. He used to literally go to the U.S. Open and ride switch. And the judges didn't even know he was riding switch. He was that like technical as a freestyle rider. And then like, so that was like, let me think 94, 95. And then that year we went to, for TV five, I think it was 96. Um, he was riding twins and he wanted another twin. And the, the um, team manager, Eric Koch, who was the team manager at the time, didn't have any more twin tips. And he's like, Oh, yo, yo just ride this board. And it was a, a supermodel that Craig developed Johan was so bummed. He's like, dude, I can't, I can't ride this twin, this thing. I have to ride a twin. He was so bummed. And then, and the graphic like sucked and he had like spray paint. It's like in the movies, like spray paint the graphic. And then I remember the day he rode that thing. Cause it was like a directional board that Craig Kelly rode, you know, and Johan was filming in Tahoe with us and starting to free ride and just so naturally talented. Right. And then he gets on this board and it's like a light bulb went off and he just started going Richter like riding lines, big lines in Tahoe, doing backside threes into the chute and just crazy stuff. You're like, what is he doing? And then when he took that board up to Alaska and he rode that in Alaska and he was just like, literally he, he's like, oh, I'm going to go over there and come down. And Mike's always like, where are you going to go? What are you going to do? You know, as a filmer. And he, Mike used to always joke, like shooting, Johan was like shooting wildlife. You had to just point the camera because you just didn't know what was going to happen <laughs> and that alaska trip was like that it was like he was just like a an animal out of his cage and he's just going crazy so watch that tv5 part of him in alaska and that was like really the first time i saw anybody do like freestyle type stuff in a big mountains thing wow mm-hmm. you know and <sighs> it's just crazy big mountain freestyling yeah, yeah. that's sick so uh, one thing we were talking about that was really interesting to me on the phone before you came in, you know, a few days ago, whenever that was, mm-hmm. uh, we were talking about style and I love the conversation of style. It's totally subjective, mm-hmm. but you said, you know, you're, you're very particular about what you find and how you, how you pick somebody with good style, what goes into it, what, and, and what do you think are the factors for you of what makes somebody have good style and who would you put in the category of some of the greats? I mean, that's a big topic, but, you know, and like you said, it's subjective to the person. So if you're asking me, it's like my personal opinion. You know, I think there's all types of different style in any sport. Um, For me, what I like and what really is attractive to me in a style of snowboarding is somebody who has their kind of control over their body, you know, Um, that's not super crazy. They, They just are smooth and their brain and their body and their board is all working together, you know. Um, I mean, I have a huge list, but, you know, Craig Kelly. Um, I mean, somebody now, like Blake Paul, like that's a perfect example for the now, you know. Like he just has control. He's not doing the biggest thing, the craziest thing. He just has, like, control to me. So control is good, you know. Like if you have control on a rail, Chris, I was saying, like, that's good style. That's mm-hmm. killer. You know, it's control. So it's like – being in control of your situation, whether you're, I think you're free riding or hitting a jump or things like that, like JP Solberg, Hakey Sorsa, guys like that, that were hitting jumps. I always looked down like they have body control. They know where they're at They're That was good style to me. Um, and then turning, you know, that's a whole different thing, but um, just Craig Kelly uh, entering and exiting a turn, Terry A. Hawkinson, like, I mean, if anybody ever rode with Terry at a ski resort, it's pretty mind blowing to just ride behind him and just go, what is going on? Like just his control of his board and what he can do with his board, you know, just riding down a green run. So Mm -hmm. to me, that's style. Uh, What 
Do you want to break down the enter and exit of a turn for a, a layman that doesn't know um, the fundamentals of a turn? Um, I don't think it's that important, really. You know, I mean, turning can be just guiding your snowboard where you want it to go um, and controlling your speed. But to me, I come, come from surfing, so I'm, I'm pretty, you know, particular about... Yeah, maybe it, snobby would that be <laughs> Snobby is a very <laughs> good word, for sure. Turn snob? <laughs> But it, it matters, you know, in, entering with the front edge of your board, like the, the nose of your board, and, you know, in your in your turn, you're, like, in the middle of your side cut, and then you're exiting off the tail, and it's just like a zzz, like, mm -hmm. so that's a turn to me. Like a samurai slice. Yeah, it's just, like, entering and then in, exiting a turn instead of just kind of <laughs> sliding and controlling your speed and slowing down as opposed to, like, turning your board. Like, if, when I watched Noah taught me a lot about that. Noah. Noah Slaznik. Noah Slaznik. Yep. Give me an air horn there. Absolutely. At least one. Um, he he was like one person that really taught me how to come over a, a convex roll with style and not blind myself and turn into the line. Because a lot of stuff we we film, like especially in Tahoe, there's like a convex roll. Like there's like a roll and you start up here with fighting, it just rolls over into this st steep, spiny thing. Can't see where you're going. Yeah, and you can't see where you're going. And um, he taught me how to like turn into it. And con you're controlling your speed by turning. You're not just like slowing down and scrubbing speed. You're like riding the line, mm -hmm. you know? And that was like something that really like I wanted to, to do was to like ride the line instead of just like survive the line. Mm -hmm. Cause there can be a lot of that. Like you can go down some pretty gnarly stuff, but it's just kind of survival mm -hmm. as opposed to like ripping down this line. Mm -hmm. um, well, for so, the, for the layman too, like what's really common uh, when you're riding a big mountain line or, or, something that's a convex roll mm -hmm. is a, I remember my first experience you drop in you do your first turn and as you throw your snow it, you throw it in front of you white and, room and the white room and, you, <laughs> and then you're all of a sudden you're heading off of, towards some mm -hmm. finger and you can't see where you're going mm -hmm. and then you got to kind of like slow down and it's a disaster mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so like learning how to turn to keep the snow behind you and things yeah. like that is what you're talking yeah, about yeah you kind of don't want to spray your face all the time I mean face shots feel great and I, I love face shots but like there's a time to do that and not it just there's a lot of different types of turns really like i find myself now i'm 53 and i feel like i'm snowboarding better now than i ever did as far as turning goes like i just have a little more knowledge about the board and what it's doing and my in and turning i feel like i am turning better than i did when i was you know 30 so mm -hmm. it's something that you can c improve even though you're getting old and decrepit now I know you're huge into surfing. Uh, what what kind of what kind of factors does that play in a uh, the eternal fountain of youth? Like you and Richards and people that surf a lot seem to not age, and uh, b <laughs> in turning. Um, I think the ocean's great just to be in. You know, it's awesome. Um, surfing is like opposite of snowboarding. Snowboarding is like really like static, and you get really stiff and sore because you're just like shock absorbing all day long. Um, surfing, you're, it's a very fluid thing and you're paddling and you're using your upper body. And so it's a different thing. It's really good for your body. Um, after surfing for 10 hours a day, you could be, you just feel so good, you know, and after snowboarding 10 hours, I can barely walk. So it's a different thing for your body. Um, but it's good for now that I look back at my career snowboarding, like surfing, cause I surf for, I don't know, 10, 12 years before I started snowboarding and that really helped my snowboarding because like I was just trying to surf on the snow when I was riding powder, you know, yep. and that's like a big influence Yeah, there. So in regards to surfing, I got one little sidebar I got to throw in there. Uh, Alex Andrews, AKA the frost puppy, who is your mentor E, uh, He's my he's my bro. Padawan? He's your bro. Yeah, he's your bro. Uh, he's learned a lot from you through Burton and life in general. But he's I surf with him. And the way, you know, I'm I'm not good at surfing. We live in Utah. We're landlocked. Didn't grow up surfing. Horrible at surfing. Love it, though. So when I go out there, I paddle out to pass the wave, stop, and then just wait till the wave kind of comes to right where I'm sitting. He said, nah, dude, when you're surfing with Dave, you don't ever stop. You're always paddling. You're always paddling. You don't ever sit on your board. Uh yeah, I mean, that's what I do, you know, like... Um, <laughs> You're always just heat-seeking after the waves well, as they're coming in? Yeah, I mean, you could just paddle out the back and sit there and wait for the, trying to get the, the, biggest, count. the biggest wave of the day to come in kind of thing, but I'm usually, like, just prowling the inside and kind of paddling around and catching waves and stuff, so... Just from living in California, that's where I grew up. So there's people in California, obviously. A lot of people. And you have to, like, know how to, like, catch waves with 
60 guys in the water. So you got to move around and watch the ocean and watch what's happening and pay attention and capitalize on that. So that's he, why I hardly he has the opposite it. technique as Hucker. Yes. Who is a BMXer who just catches the big closeouts because no one else wants them. Yeah, yeah. I don't like those. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he we just had, said, screw it, I'm going for the closeouts. It's the only way I'm going to get away. <laughs> so you're yeah, what's just your catching tech? the good ones you're not, on the You're inside. not going for the closeouts? I'm not going for the closeouts. I don't like big waves. I, like, I, don't, I hate big waves. Um, I don't like being in you know death situations. Um, I like good waves. Just like in snowboarding, I, I never liked like these crazy death experience things. I don't need that in my life. I don't need that kind of adrenaline. I like the fun things. Fun things. Yeah. Um, Cole Barish is one of our Patreons, and you kind of answer this. What influence has surfing had mm. in your snowboarding? Are there any other ways mm -hmm. beyond what you had told us? Yeah. No. Yeah, Cole. I think um, it's influenced me a lot of ways of even how I kind of was a professional. Like, I wanted to be, like, well-rounded. I think that came from surfing, too. Like I wanted to, you know, surfing, you want to surf small waves, big waves, barrels, all these things, have all of your maneuvers to, you know, be a good surfer. And that kind of translated into snowboarding. So like I wanted to be good at the half pipe and wanted to be good at jumping and spinning. I wanted to be good at free riding and riding groomers and handrails, you know, and all of it. So that was something that got brought from surfing i think that's awesome mm -hmm. so we got to take a quick break to talk to you guys about one of our sponsors brighton resort uh it's personally my favorite place to ride how about you buds it's my favorite place as well i think i've got about 20 passes there now under my belt in the past 20 years unreal yeah I've, i know downing's filmed many a clips up there i was watching the tb movies it's a iconic place it's got a great culture great snowboard park you can jump off some cliffs um really Big part of my life and a lot of other people's life is Brighton Resort. And their season passes are available now. Discounted passes go till October 11th. Buy one now and save. If you're going to buy one, might as well buy it now before October 11th. Get yourself a Brighton Pass. I think it's time to talk about Liquid Death. One oh, the Liquid D. Yeah, one of my favorite beverages. As as you know, I love to crush these cans. Oh, it's a great... You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to crack a can crack right one now. Crack right now, you I, know? You know, Sage, he called them... Uh, Licky D. Licky D. He calls them Licky D's. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's one of the greatest things. It's not actually a beer. It's just water in a can. Uh, you can it drink like it while driving, right? No one's going to throw mm -hmm. harsh looks at you. Or they might throw harsh looks at you because it looks like a beer. But. Exactly. It's nice because, our, like I've said it before, but our uh, neighbors at the building next door, I think they think we're alcoholics because we're drinking it about 8 a.m. Yeah, we're just so walking around crushing cans. That's a huge benefit of it. You can drink them on the chairlift. You can drink them on the chairlift. You can drink them in the lift line. Lifties like to yell at you for having a beer. You might get yelled at and say, hey, this is actually a water. It's just a licky death. It's just a licky D. <laughs> so they're available at 7-Eleven or Whole Foods. And the best place to get them is to go to liquiddeath.com slash bombhole. You'll get a, fr a few free koozies. Again, that is liquiddeath.com slash bombhole. And, uh, you know, show a little support to us because they support the show. Okay, let's get into the Liquid Death Spinning Wheel of Death. Here we go. Welcome to the Liquid Death. Death, death, death. Spinning Wheel of Death. <laughs> so uh explain what's going on here but yeah so you're gonna spin the wheel and you got to give it a good good spin here and uh what you land on will be your fate there's nothing too crazy on there today uh -oh. like eat bugs or anything like that uh -oh. but uh yeah there's some donate to the bomb hole do a smelling salt Don't, blind bomb touch taste bomb hole donate. oh we donate yeah yeah, so we you might hit us with we might be donating some money to your tell you charity. where to donate stuff. So. Yeah, give us a what good spin, spin and we'll tell you where you land. Pretty good spin. Oh, blind touch test. Blind touch test. What's that? We're gonna put three items in front of you. You got to blindfold yourself and try to guess what they are. Oh jeez. Oh jeez. Yeah, that looks like it'll work, huh? There we go. Can you see? No, I don't think you can All see. Right. Um. Okay. What do I do? Put it on the desk right in front of you. So turn to the left. It's right in front of you. Touch the desk. There it is. Feels like hair. So what do I got to do? Guess it? Guess what yeah. it is. Guess what it is. He's touching it's it. It's a toupee. Yeah. It's, it's a wig. Yeah, it's that's my hair. It's <laughs> my hair. Can I put it on? It's a full wig. Can I put it on? Or yeah, sure. Put it on. <laughs> I've always wanted hair. <laughs> 
<laughs> Hold on a second. I can take my headphones off. Well, there's two styles. See, yeah, I don't what, have, I don't have, oh, that blonde one's <laughs> sick. Oh, great. What, what color is your, your hair naturally? It's color brown. So this is what you look like? <laughs> <laughs> is that good? Wild hairstyle. I think it's on backwards. Yeah. Oh, is it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's kind of like a butt cut. It's just like. Well, it's, it was on back. Oh, yeah, that's a go. good look. Yeah. Wow, How's dude. How's that? I wow. love it. You should maybe really rock that for a little bit. Right. Uh, <laughs> I don't have to shave my head. We got two more items you got to pick, so you got to put the beanie back on. You should keep that thing on for a sec, though. No? <laughs> He's kind of weird. He's kind of nasty. <laughs> yeah. Uh, throw, yeah, throw the thing over your eyes, and then I got a couple more items in the old uh, blind. He's doing, he's doing pretty good so far. All right. Keep a little forward. <laughs> keep going forward. There it is. Okay, he's feeling it out. Shake weight. Yes. Wow. wow. Shake weight is a very easy thing to identify. I guess. I yeah. would have never guessed it was so easy to guess a shake weight. I okay. thought it was a dumbbell at first, but then I kind of, it, it didn't weigh much, so. And then we got one more. Okay, one more. All right. It's All on right. the table. All right, is it there? Yep. This is right. And decide if he's a champion or not. See if he goes oh, to croc. Yeah, that's correct. Ooh. Wow. Okay. Because my kid, my son Dylan has a pair. So yeah, Crocs are kind of in right now. Let me see your Crocs. Let's yeah. see if they're I different got than the one I got. <clears throat> yeah. Wow. Really nice work. Them. Three for three, dog. Wow. I oh, even got some stuff you stick in them, huh? So we don't really like to go in chronological order. I kind of beat the dead horse with that. We just jump around wherever. And I'm really interested in the role in which you've kind of developed split boards for Burton and I think just split boarding in general, you know, it's very popular now. Everybody loves split boarding. Buds and I go split boarding all the time, but it, it definitely wasn't like that 10 years ago. Um, yeah. Can you just explain like kind of the role you had in developing the split board for Burton and uh -huh. where it's at now? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> first off, it wasn't like something I developed. Well, let me go back. It, Split boarding existed for sure in Europe. I know, I think Nitro, um, Volet made split boards and stuff. I don't even know what years and stuff. This is just my story and how it happened with me. So just to clarify that. I lived in Utah here in Salt Lake City uh, in the early 90s, uh, 94. So let me think. Nin 1995 um, was the first year I got on one or used one. And how that happened was uh, Brad Chaffel who lived here at Gibbon Airhorn. There we go. So Brad was a um, uh, team rider for Burton, and he lived in Salt Lake City. Great guy. And he's um, basically worked at Milo Sport. He worked at Salty Peaks too. But I went in there one day to get my board tuned from Brad, and there was a split board in the background. And this is in like 95. I'm like, whoa, what is that thing? And I started looking at it. And, you know, he's like, oh, yeah, it's a demo. You can use it. Check it out. I'm like, oh, because I've seen like, I was hiking at behind Brighton, which is an awesome place to snowboard. It's just amazing backcountry. That's where I was learning everything because I came from Big Bear, California, and I moved to Utah to snowboard better because Craig Kelly told me, like, dude, get out of the park, go in the backcountry. So I did that. And I'm in, in Utah hiking behind Brighton. I'm seeing skiers back there. I really didn't understand it, like the zigzag thing up the deal. And then I saw the split board, and I'm like, oh, that's crazy. I don't know if that works. It was all heavy and weird. And I... I used it one day. I remember I went behind Brighton and I took like six runs on something that normally I'd take like maybe two. And I was like, this is crazy, dude. And this thing actually kind of works and it was heavy. And I had like six sick runs and I was like, this is insane. I'm walking up on the same thing I'm coming down on. And I'm like, this is nuts. So one thing led to another and I started begging JG who deserves an air horn. He's Absolutely. from, from Burton and he is, um, <clears throat> a product guy at the, at the time. So I'm begging him like, dude, let's make a split board. And he's like, dude, I can make, I'll just cut one in half. First he cuts one and we he makes one. And we, I rode that and I actually rode that in, let me think TB six, I think or seven. And then he started making some split boards for me that just had the normal, uh, custom graphic on it. And I was filming on it a little bit. Like if I had to go do a big line, I would hike on the split board to go do the line kind of thing. Um, and then I just started begging Burton, just like, hey, we got to do this. And at that time, nobody really, like, believed in it, that they work. And I was just like, these, these things work, you know? And so I'm like, I'm going to film a whole video part on it, and I'm going to prove to people that they work. And 
you know, <laughs> like I remember Jeremy Jones from here from Utah. I was like, I was with him and I bet him 200 bucks. I'm like, I'm going to film a whole part. He's like, no, you're not blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm like, I'm, I'm going to do it. <laughs> Cause I used to bet Jeremy all the time on rails and he'd always win. He'd take my money. And so I'm trying to get back at him. Right. So anyways, <clears throat> I go out and I filmed the whole year on a board that we made. We made a prototype one that was like colored. One ski was yellow and one ski was red. Cause I'm like, oh, I want to make sure people know that I'm riding a split board. And then I went and filmed that whole year on that board. Um, and you know, I did it just to prove a point really that they work. Um, and I'm stoked to see like how things are nowadays. Like so many people are into it, you know, in split boarding. I still love it. Um, and I think they're just a great tool to access the backcountry on. They're not, they're just a tool. Like, I mean, if you can hike something, just hike it. If you can take a snowmobile, take a snowmobile. If you want to get, if the best thing is to take a heli, obviously. But if you want that experience of walking in the backcountry and uh, enjoying a great day on a split board, it's awesome. That's cool to hear you guys do it because it's, it's killer. It. It's a different experience, you know. Um, and, you know, one thing I'd like to say is before you do it, get educated. You know, um, don't just go out there blindly. Take it really slow. It doesn't have to be gnarly terrain that you're splitboarding in. Actually, the best splitboarding terrain usually is pretty mellow, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and simple pleasures are great on a splitboard. You can just, mm -hmm. just hike up some little gladed tree run and put it together and ride down. It's sick, you know. Yeah. So It definitely gives you that degree of appreciation mm -hmm. for your mm -hmm. turn a little mm -hmm. bit more. And it's so funny because I was an avid hater for so mm -hmm. long. <laughs> I was like, fuck, splitboard's so stupid. I have a snowmobile. Just like, you know, I used to say, you know, I... I earned my turns. I earned a bunch of money. I bought a gift snowmobile. Now I get to get some fucking turns, you know, like all kinds of, that was like my mentality for a long time. And I remember I went and I was like, the first time I was like, God damn it. This is awesome. You sound like, <laughs> you sound like Kevin Jones, my buddy, Kevin Jones. He, he used to just make fun of me. Yeah. Just like tear into me. And I love Kevin. He was like a really good friend. And he used to tear into me, you know, and now he loves split boarding. Mm -hmm. It's so cool to see that, you know, for me, like, I'm proud of that, that mm -hmm. Kevin Jones, like, loves the split board. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's great, you know? Like, I love it. You know, it's another thing, too. It's like, the, I realize half the things we do, I, I like the banter. It's like, you're going up the skin track. The banter's amazing, you know? And you're you're talking the whole time. You're eating, pull over, eat some snacks. Yeah. You're pointing at things with your poles, which, yeah. you know, like, we don't have poles. You know, we've talked yeah. about that in the show, but, like, sweet. You I'm always, like, I'm, a lot of people have, like, their poles hanging out. I've always been, like, I want to look like a snowboarder. Mm -hmm. Like when I'm snowboarding, I care more about snowboarding than I do yeah. going up. Like I know a lot of people in Europe use hard boots and all this stuff. And yep. like, I'm like, no, I'm, a, I'm a snowboarder. I love soft snowboard boots, you know? Um, so I always have my pack like pretty small, uh, my pack, all my poles, everything goes inside. Mm -hmm. That's just me. Like, I don't like a lot of, dangling things yeah, off me and stuff like it, looks, it definitely <laughs> looks a little more tour touring vibes totally. if you got the poles hanging out the back totally but. so but i still love it you know um i got my kids into split boarding now um you know and burton still makes split boards and a lot of companies make split boards it's great you know so to see people split boarding is it's really cool mm -hmm. um i actually go i'll step back a little bit about that you know tb9 year i filmed that video part and then burton the pr people at burton like knew we were making this board and they set me up on this PR tour. It was crazy in New York. <laughs> and I went to New York city and they had me on this PR tour going to all these like Vogue magazine and men's health. And uh, I was traveling around New York in August with the board bag with the split board. And I'd go and sit in this editor's like office and I would explain what this thing is. So we get like magazine coverage or whatever. Was it working? It, it worked, you know, like, cause people learned about it, yeah. you know, but people had no idea they would look at it and be like what is that yeah, you like, know? how like, does this work, this work? You know? <laughs> it was pretty funny so i've heard now sales are just through the roof for brands too it is i think it's doing pretty good i mean it's not you know i mean most people just want to have a go take four runs and go get a hamburger and a beer at yeah a ski resort but you know um it's doing good doing good mm -hmm. one thing to talk about too is you guys were on the forefront of you know, take, for example, Utah, you have kind of Grizzly Gulch. You guys were some of the first people to go up there and, you know, find jumps, build jumps, hike around those mm -hmm. areas. And I think that's fascinating because, you know, for me as, you know, fourth generation, I don't know how, mm -hmm. how many more mm -hmm. generations behind mm -hmm. you guys are it was, but you go up there and you know, at the there's so many jumps. Oh, 
you know, these are the TB cliffs. These mm-hmm. are the, this mm-hmm. is uh, Chad's gap. This is, everything's been hit. There's pyramid gap. Here's mm-hmm. what's been done on that. And it, I just can't imagine what it would have been like to go up there and there's A, there's not very many people up there mm-hmm. and B, just kind of this blank canvas of like, like, like possibility that nobody really tapped into, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good subject actually because the, the world was kind of a blank canvas at that time. You know, in the early 90s, it was like nothing was done. So whether it was Utah or Tahoe or Washington, Jackson Hole, it was pretty, you know, a blank canvas. Um, and to be able to go out with people that were re- into searching around and stuff, like going up, hiking Grizzly Gulch and all these places with Kurt Heine and building jumps, like I said earlier, with Peter Line, that was really cool, you know. Um, and then obviously being in the Sierra Nevadas and Tahoe area with the hatchets. I mean, Dave Hatchet was huge at like pioneering stuff and Mike Hatchet, but Dave and I would go out all the time on like um, down days, like gray weather down days and just look for stuff, go all over the place and find things. And I was really into that. That was like actually what I really enjoyed the most was like pioneering things and like finding this sick zone and like figuring out how to get on top of it and how to film it and all that, you know, um, that was really, really cool. The, th- the thrill understand. of the hunt? The thrill of the hunt, yeah, like finding like a sick cliff band or, mm-hmm. you know, something that you've been looking for and, oh, my God, it's perfect and mm-hmm. I can't wait for it to snow another two feet and we're going to come back here and hit this thing. And mm-hmm. so that was really cool, you know. That's the stuff, like I said earlier, that nobody really sees and that's mm-hmm. like the most special thing to me mm-hmm. is being out with my buddies doing that, you know, Um and finding those rad features. Totally. Something that's never been filmed before. Yeah, man. totally. Because we found a lot of stuff, you know, and st- stuff that's still filmed today. Yeah, that's you know? the funny thing. You it's know? all still filmed, huh? Mm-hmm. And, and it's cool down. to see people do it a little different, you know, like one-up everybody on things. That's c- totally cool, you know, because a good feature is a good feature. If it's snowboardable, you know, like a, whether it's a cliff, you know, like Whistler has tons of them, you know, like – it's like they're perfect. Whistle, you go to Whistler and everything's just perfect. Flat takeoff, flat takeoff, perfect. Le- it's like, oh my gosh, no wonder Devin's insane. He is insane. <laughs> like it's like everything's just so good up there. So I remember in Whistler one time with uh, Mikey Rents. So I got to mm-hmm. be quick. Yeah, yeah. And we were we were uh, snowmobiling past, and I looked up and I'm like, oh my god, that's a perfect step down. Like yeah, perfect landing or whatever. Yeah. I'm like, dude, can we hit that? He's like. Yeah, I think he said something. He's like, yeah, the first time I hit that, I was uh, nine. Yeah, he was <laughs> like, nine, yeah, totally, totally, totally. <laughs> it's like, that's the low-hanging fruit, but that low-hanging fruit would be like the yeah. best spot in Utah. Yeah. Going back to the Utah stuff, you know, watching some of the TB movies, mm-hmm. doing my research, mm-hmm. it's such a trip because you watch these videos from the 90s mm-hmm. and you guys are jumping off cliffs that we snowboard under every day on the, you know, on a powder day at Brighton, you could look around and mm-hmm. see Oh my God, that's mm-hmm. that, that, that is all from the TV movies. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's just cool. Yeah. 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 Kind of like I said, in the beginning it was that ski resort. a lot of, a lot of the filming in the earlier days and especially the early nineties were at ski resorts. Cause we didn't really have access to back country and stuff until we started snowmobiling, you know, and I was a big part of the, that movement. Um, I'm trying to think of the year. It's probably 96. And I remember like snowmobiles and, you know, Mac dog and Mike hatchet, we were just getting into it and the snowmobiles kind of sucked and we would always getting stuck, but we're using these things to get out and access places and find places and pioneer stuff. So I was a big part of that group, you know, to go find things, um, in the United States, you know, there's a whole nother group of people doing that up in Canada, Brian Safard and a bunch of other people, but, um, in the state, especially in Tahoe, uh, a little bit in Utah, you know, snowmobiling was pretty cool. So uh, one other thing I got to ask is, you know, in the early days of snowboarding, you know, you're very well versed. You lived through that time. Which snowboarders do you think had the biggest impact on snowboarding today? Well, with, without a doubt, Craig Kelly, um, just because I don't, it's hard to, for me to imagine like a professional snowboarder without Craig, because he was kind of the first like professional snowboarder. Um, he just did so much about for snowboarding and Craig Kelly for sure. Um, and then JP Walker is a huge, um, and Jeremy Jones, but like JP changed a lot of things. Just that whole thing, the urban thing, you, I'm sure is a huge inspiration for you and anybody doing handrails. JP is it. Mm-hmm. Cause I was there. I was, I was there when I, you know, I was his friend and like he lived here in Utah and I lived here in Utah and he wasn't he, like, he was into handrails and stuff. But like, I remember I was on a trip 
in uh, Sweden. And I'll never forget it because we were staying at this hotel and it was a half, we were there with Mac Dog and other people and it was a RA or whatever. And we were like at this half pipe contest for some reason, Terry was there and we we're hanging out. And then at the hotel we were staying at, there's this sick like 30 stair handrail right in front of the hotel in the city. And JP's like, dude, he's like looking at that. He's like, come and check this thing out with me. I'm like, what, this is, what are you talking about? Like there's stairs and it was just like, it was the first time I saw somebody like eye up a, straight up street handrail and like want to do it and i was like what are you doing you know i remember his jacket too he had that like a special band jacket uh, it was like blue stripes with the american flag on the shoulder mm -hmm. and he like stepped to this handrail right at the hotel it, it went right into the like lobby of the thing and <laughs> it was just wow dude like this is different now and that's kind of what for me like I saw him start that and then he just kept taking it with him and his group of friends and what they did in the urban environment, you know, like traveling to cities and I was like, you guys are nuts, you know, like it just, ch that changed a lot. So that's kind of why I say JP Walker. Um, and you know, there's a lot of people like peers of mine that I looked up to, uh, Chris Roach, like I said, Noah Slaznik, those guys are big, like in that whole style and making snowboarding rad, mm -hmm. you know? It's so cool here to hear you talk. When you think about snowboarding nowadays, I look at so many people, and and it's become so compartmentalized. Like you have your mm -hmm. your jump guys that just hit backcountry jumps, mm -hmm. your contest guys, mm -hmm. your and when you look at your career, it's like you you hit rails. You're in the Nick, you know, you're at the Nixon Jib Fest. Mm -hmm. You're you're riding Alaska. You're hitting half pipe contest. Half -pipe I used contest. to follow my yeah. you know girlfriend around like to half pipe contest. Mm -hmm. Shannon was going to half pipe contest, so I wanted to go to half pipe contest. Yep. So I'm like <laughs> hanging out half pipe contests and um. Yeah, it was it was a you know a thing where you had to do a lot of stuff to be a pro snowboarder at that at those times, you know. Um, but even before me, you know, like people raced, they they would like race and GS and slalom. They did half pipe, photo shoots, video things. They did all that. That's that was being a pro snowboarder, um, you know. And then like Kevin Jones, like I said, he would film a Mac Dog part and a standard films part and win X Games and go like. It was gnarly. That's crazy. Gnarly. Like, kids don't understand. Like, he was grinding, like, mm -hmm. you know, two major video parts and, and, big old and winning launch. the X Games. Yeah, it's like nuts. I think that could be a perfect segue for a guest question that we have from none other than Kevin Jones. Oh, geez. Here we go. <clears throat> Dave Downing. KJ here. <laughs> guest question of the day. Could you please demonstrate how to construct the t-shirt do-rag? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and how does this help you whilst performing on a handrail? Especially at the inaugural Nixa Jib Feds events. And could you please <laughs> wear said do rag for <laughs> the next ten minutes? All right, Kevin. I love all his delays. Yeah, his, right. His, his delivery there. It's a selfie of him walking around his garage <laughs> filming himself. By for, the way, first so. I gotta tell the story. It was so funny. Ke Kevin is the best person to hang out with because he just makes fun of people all the time. He's just <laughs> classic, and he's. He's just a special guy. But anyway, <laughs> we're at the Nixon Jib Fest and JP's like got tape on his fingers and he's got like a dangler off his thing. And Kevin's like making fun of him and, you know, <laughs> he's got the do-rag and JP is like, yeah, dude, like I'll teach you how to make a do-rag. And he's like making this, we, he taught us like how to make do-rags. It was so <laughs> funny. And uh, I don't know if I remember that. You're wearing that. one in that photo right there, huh? No, that's just oh, that's a beanie, not, but that's a beanie. We'll have but, to get. Should we get a bomb hole shirt? Yeah, for this? let's get a bomb. I'll go I, grab you a shirt. I, I might be able to do it, dude. I don't yeah. Know. Does it matter what size it is? Uh, extra large, because then I can keep it and wear it. All right. So I'm. This is the do. If I can remember, this is the do rag thing. JP taught me. I'm, I'm not going to put tape on my fingers, though. <laughs> I always thought those were finger bands. I thought they were like sweat bands for your fingers. No, dude, it was like tape or something. Yeah, tape. Oh, okay. Is it because he hurt his fingers, or is it? No, he just wanted to look dope. You wanted to look, oh, wow. You how's, did that wait, easy, dude. How's that little flap in the back? Yeah, that's that's how's my look. flap? No, Kevin, that, Kevin's probably going to like critique my flap, but. That's a pretty solid flap. That was quick, oh, too, yeah. how you put that up. 
Oh yeah, that looks good. Yeah, you got to, yeah. so you got to clock in ten minutes with that thing. <laughs> so ten minutes, okay. Yeah, according cool. to KJ, are you All gonna right. throw your headphones? I'll on go headphones yeah. on the do rag. Oh, that's a good look. It's a really good look. There yeah. we go. I'm back. KJ, this is for you, bro. And yeah. that went up quick. And too. I, he, I guess he <laughs> one of his questions was, uh, how did it uh, help your performance on the rails? It didn't really. Like I was just trying to keep up with Kevin. <laughs> it might have been a look good, feel good <laughs> type of totally, moment. Though, yeah, you know, it was totally. That was at uh, Snow Summit Jib Fest. Mm-hmm. And uh, I f- that was the second one, maybe. Yeah, if I'm f- remembering right. But those events were super cool. I don't know if I should talk about that, but it was yeah, really cool. Like, um, that was Chad Danetta at Nixon. He deserves another air horn too. He's an awesome <laughs> guy. But he, um, you know, came to myself um, and then JP and Jeremy and like, dude, what do you guys want to do? And he's that kind of guy, you know. Yeah. And we just came up with an idea. Of, that was at the time where like. X Games and Super Serious contests were coming in and stuff like that. And we're like, yeah, we just want to do something fun and blah, blah, blah. And there was not, nothing with, you know, rails or that type of thing yet, really. So we just like, hey, let's invite our friends and let's just do our own thing. Um, and it wasn't really a contest. It was just like a hangout. Looked awesome. You know, but it was super fun. Got the cover of some magazines, right? Yeah, had a lot of content. Like, Chad was great. Chad, Chad used to work for Transworld. Mm. And then he started Nixon, so he had all these contacts, and he basically got all the media there, the photographers and filmers, and MacDog was there, obviously, and yeah. and we, did the videos that MacDog did, which was great. And it so, worked out. Yeah. And we have an iconic print of you doing a nose press from the Jib Fest that Rob Mathis got to give an air horn to Rob. Yep. Uh, from the glory days. Glory yeah. days. The glory there, days. There was a video called Game Show that I grew up on, and I'm not sure which Jib Fest it was, but I remember specifically Nate Bozong doing a back lip Mm-hmm. And, and JP doing a back lip yep. on a rail. Yep. And it was the first time I remember seeing a snowboard back lip and being like, oh, fuck, that's how you, mm-hmm. that's, yeah, that's a back that's lip. That's how yep. you do it. I that's think it was from this one at at, uh, at Bear Mountain. I yeah. Think yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And Jeff Anderson was there. Yep. Jeffy deserves a couple of. Yes. Yeah, yeah Jeffy. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, and then you know they had the circle rail, so much iconic things. That's, and, I remember and, that and, cover. Mm-hmm. Who Kevin Jones? I think had a cover on that. Maybe. Yeah, or maybe Jeremy. I can't remember. No, it was Brian Thien. Maybe oh, Thien. Yeah, Thien was like always the standout guy at, at the Jib Fest. He always had such He's good style. Sick, huh? good. Yeah, yeah. Brian Thien was awesome. So one thing I think we should talk about is um, you're married to Shannon. Mm-hmm. She who was a you were she was a pro snowboarder as at the same time as you. Uh, you guys have an awesome family and things like that, but uh, I'm curious as to how you guys managed your relationship, both being pros and and being in the industry, and and what that looked like. Yeah, that six career. month window of would you see each other or not? Or yeah, yeah, it was it was it was tough. You know, like I said, that's kind of why I got into riding half pipes and stuff like that because she, she was going to yeah, she was going to half pipe contests, but. You know, when we were dating, I, I lived here in Salt Lake City, and she had an apartment here in Salt Lake City. I lived actually at Tina's Bassage's house, and I rented a room. She deserves an air horn, too. Um, and um, so we were dating here. I was filming videos at the time, and she was doing a contest. So, you know, when we were here, we were seeing each other, but then I would travel around as much as I could kind of to follow her around. Um, but, yeah, we've been married for 22 years. She's awesome. Still snowboards, awesome. I mean, she for a few years, like five or six years when our kids were younger, she was just cruising with the kids. She's such an awesome mom. So she was, you know, not that into snowboarding. Now she, she's totally into it. She's ripping, dude. That's like, awesome. it's so sick. Like, in the backcountry and stuff, she's just on it. Like, it's really, really cool. And once my kids got um, older, so I, Logan's 18 now and Dylan's 16, wow. you know, but once they started, like, riding and she just got back into it, it's super cool to see her, like, love snowboarding and um, cause she's good at it. She's awesome. She did a lot for, for women's snowboarding in general. Yeah. I mean, people don't really know, but she pioneered a lot of things, um, especially women's product, um, just boundaries for, for women, uh, style, all kinds of stuff in snowboarding. So you know, all the women out there deserve to give her a big, a round of applause. It's crazy. You met her on your first trip too. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. It was that, that Italy trip. I met her on that trip. That's wild. Yeah. Yeah, and she thought it was, uh, she heard him, like this guy Dave Dowd was going, but she thought it was Dave Dowd. Oh, she thought you were Dave you know Dowd? Dave Dowd, and yeah. she's like, why is Dave Dowd going on this trip? I'm like, <laughs> it was pretty funny. That's so awesome. now that you're your dad, uh, how rewarding is it watching, you know, what, like you had a career, and now you watch your mm-hmm. kids and get to go snowboard with your kids mm-hmm. and your family. What, you know, how does that compare to being a pro? It's way better. I mean, uh, just riding, 
I mean, I remember like eight years ago, I was telling people like, I would rather go take groomer runs with my kids and go out in the back country and shred. Like, it's just so rewarding and fun to like, just follow your kids around and watch them like look at a side hit and go over to it and just like hit it. You know, like it's so cool. Like just little things like that are just really rewarding for me as a dad to see that. And then now like they're in the back country with me and they're like shuttling me to the top of stuff. It's like, this is really cool, you know? So, (laughs) um, just to see him become like into snowboarding and love it, you know, split boarding and all kinds of stuff. It's just really cool as a dad to see them get into it and like it. You know, and they're pretty deep into it or what? I mean, yeah, they're, they're into, they're into a lot of things. I mean, they're, if they're shuttling you yeah, up and stuff. They're yeah. pretty into it. Yeah, I'm No, sure. they're into it for sure. They're, they're into, you know, skateboarding, surfing a lot. They're in, really into fishing um, yeah. and snowboarding. So they're pretty active kids, but um, they're awesome. That's cool. Have the tuna been hitting out there on the boat? Dude, that's a whole nother podcast, but yeah, <laughs> it's been, it's been a pretty epic summer. Yeah. I got mm-hmm. a Patreon question about this. Yeah, let's hit it. From Charles uh, Nuccio, heli trip or boat trip? Since I've been on a lot of boat trips now, I'd say heli trip. Especially it if it's Alaska. Season, if it's Alaska, yeah, I'm down. Um, but probably heli, probably heli trip. Yeah, always yeah. heli. Bagging a big tuna or bagging a big gold heel side turn on a finger in an Alaskan line. What do you got? Like I said, I've had a lot of a lot of tuna this summer. <laughs> kind of, my, my freezer, my freezer's full, so I'd go for the heel turn in Alaska. Okay. I'm going to go back to back Patreon. Oh, here we go. Hit another so, one. So uh, this is from Travis Kerr. You were talking about Craig Kelly. Mm-hmm. Best advice or quote ever heard from Craig or memory if you can't remember specific words. Okay. I got to take the do rag off because I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm talking about Craig. I'm talking about Craig. That's good. Respect. Good I got to take the do rag off because he, he. I would, think that was 10 minutes, too. I think that's yeah, cool. he, that would, he, would, he would die if I was talking minutes. with a do rag on. Um, like I said before, I think it was the breathing thing that Craig taught oh, me, you know? That was on a different. Or, yeah, so re- reiterate oh, that sorry. so the listeners know. So the, the best thing advice Craig gave me, there's two things. Um, the first thing was to breathe when you're snowboarding and turning. Because c- when Craig used to snowboard, I, y- you could hear him coming. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> like, he's riding behind you. You can hear it. You're like, dude, what? And then, and then he's like, yeah, dude, you got to breathe when you turn. I'm like, he's like, I was doing a turn. And I was with Jeff Curtis. I remember in North Cascade Heli. He's like, oh, that would have been kind of cool. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, you weren't breathing. You're all stiff. I'm like, what do you, what do you mean? He's like, dude, you got to breathe. I'm like, you know, I'm like, whoa, like, okay. And this from then on, like I was, I breathe more, I think when I snowboard, you know, um, I'm not so tense. I try not to be. Um, and I think that has to do a lot in, in jumping too, you know, like you see people hit the lip and they're like, <gasps> they, they like seize up, you know, cause they're holding their breath. But if you like, <sighs> and you're like flowing in the air more. So the breathing thing was, was big. Um, and then a bigger thing was just like Craig's influence kind of in my life. And, and, you know, like I said, in the beginning at the time I was riding in big bear, I was a park kid in big bear and I was started to hang out with Craig and he was like, are you just going to do that all the time? Like, you know, he was kind of like, that's how he was. He would just kind of like, not really make fun of you, but like, Oh, when are you going to go in the mountains? You know, like, I'm like, Oh, what do you mean? He's like, well, you should, do that stuff, but do it in the mountains, you know? And I'm like, Oh, okay. You know, I got to learn this. And he's like, and he taught me like, you got to learn this. Cause I, I went on some trips with Craig and I learned a lot from him. Um, but that's why I moved to Utah ultimately. And like tar- started to get into the back country and learning about being, you know, safe in the back country, know where I'm at, know how to get out of the back country, all that kind of stuff was because of Craig Kelly. So I would say that's the answer to that. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. I love what you said about you could hear him behind you breathing because mm-hmm. not many people have experienced Craig yeah. riding behind them, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he definitely breathed a lot. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's also important to educate the people that are unfamiliar with who Craig is on yeah. what an impact he's had on the sport mm-hmm. and what he's done and impact he's had on you. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's always good to make sure his, mm-hmm. his legacy carries on too. For sure, for sure, for sure. Like I said, he, you know, he did all the half pipe stuff, but he was the first guy to be like, stop doing that and be like, I'm going to be a professional snowboarder and I'm going to go in the back country and I'm going to promote snowboarding how I think it should be done. And I'm going to be a professional at that. Yes, he was so good at the half pipe. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, he was like dominating yeah, the half pipe. And he just when like, I was young, he and was he dominating. was just kind of like, I'm over, I'm going to go out in the wilderness, you know? And so he's like huge inspiration for me and, f- you know, anybody in snowboarding really, he has. Uh, a lot to do with where we're at, I think, now, for sure. 
Beautiful. I think uh, we should hit a little name that video part. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay, how are we feeling, Downing? Not was, good. Not, <laughs> not good. <laughs> Confidence at all. level zero through ten. What zero, do you got? Zero point one. Ooh, zero I point like that. One. He's got like a little glimmer of hope. Yeah, little zero. glimmer. Well, it depends on what era you're going into. He's usually here. pretty kind. Dude, we'll see how you do. Let's. If look. it's a Craig Kelly smooth groove part, Ooh, I, I would, might. I might get that one. <laughs> but well, it's right. not that one. All so right. maybe right. it's maybe it's point He's zero one. Never seen smooth groove. Okay, here we go. Dude. That's such a classic song. I know. I'm trying to think of the movie. That I have like 10 movies in my brain right now. The movie it's was made by somebody that did a guest question already. Well, it's it's a mic. I know it's a standard movie, but I don't know what one or whose part. So that's the problem. It's because I have so many. You got to understand, I used to sit in the editing room a lot with Mike. So I was like. <laughs> they all blend together. They all right? blend together. Like, is it a Noah part? Is it a. Throw a name out there because you might you might be, get lucky. I'm losing it. Okay. I'm blanking out. The correct. Well, one more hint. He did ask a guest question about a do rag. It was Kevin's? <laughs> no, it wasn't Kevin's part, was it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what, what movie how was about that? A dude? Uh <laughs> Kevin Jones in TV Nine. Where's the? We got the prize. It pack was, dude. Right behind. Kevin, oh. I'm sorry, bro. <laughs> Oof, I blacked yeah. out. I fully blacked out. <laughs> He's gonna be bummed on you for I that. Fully blacked out. We got. Uh, you got yourself a participation, participation. award. It's a bomb hole cooler filled with bomb hole goods, which are all available. I'm at putting some mahi mahi fillets in here, dude. Oh yeah, sure. Throw oh a big gosh, old dude. twenty pound tuna in there. And, uh, swag in here, dude. My kids. The problem that, that with this is my kids? kids take it. Yeah, because they wear the same size as me. Oh, and really? They just snake stuff, dude. Yeah, we, we can up. send we can load you up a couple extra yeah, hoodies before you leave. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah, you guys. We can hook the kids up. We'll we'll do a little shopping spree in the, in the warehouse. Guys. That's epic. Uh, again, if you're interested in getting a hoodie, bombhole.com. We got uh, all kinds of good stuff over I'm there. Stoked. Uh, second part of name that video part. This is for our listeners, Dave. So you do not answer this one. Um, if you guys know what video this is from, comment on Dave's Instagram when this comes out. The picture of Dave on our Instagram, I should say. For a chance to win a prize pack, we'll send you a pack if you get it right. First one. Here we go. Okay, thank you guys for playing. No clue on that. Name that video part. All right, we're going to take a quick break to talk to you guys about Bub's Naturals. Uh, the, the company has a really, really incredible story. Uh, it's basically, it's just a collagen protein com- company. They make collagen protein powder, which I hammer on the regs. Uh, but it's snowboarder owned by Sean Lake and TJ. They're basically raised by snowboarding. Uh, the brand was made in, in honor of their friend Glenn, a.k.a. Bub's, who was a longtime ski bum and became a Navy SEAL and ultimately lost his life saving others. So 10% of all the Bub's profits go to charity, which is really cool. Uh, what else, buds? Well, they, they give product or they give charity to like protect our winners and stuff like that. So they're mm-hmm. in line with what we're in line with is keep the environment going. Also, uh, collagen pretty much is the glue that keeps your body together. So I think around in your mid early twenties, you start to lose collagen. So you got to start loading up on it if you want to stay out longer days and be less sore. Um, we all take this product. Jeremy Jones pretty much swears by it. Yeah, Jeremy Jones broke both of his legs in an avalanche, and he's in the gym all the time. Huge part of his recovery is Bub's Naturals protein powder. So uh, if you're interested in getting some, head on over to bubsnaturals.com. Use promo code BOMBHOLE to save 20%. Again, bubsnaturals.com, promo code BOMBHOLE. Gets you out there boarding longer, getting more days in, so you can be like Dave and still be 52 and getting lines in and still getting after it. Uh, bubsnatural.com, promo code BOMBHOLE. Okay, we're going to jump around now. Let's talk about life after pro boarding because we had a long career, did a lot of incredible things, and ultimately found your way back to Burton, but not as a pro. Um, just like Let's just talk about that period of your life. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I had a... About a 15-year career, something like that, as a pro. Um, 
And, you know, I was, I had, I started, I had kids, Jen and I had kids. Um, and I talked to Jake and I'm like, Hey, you know, I have a lot to offer to this company in the sport besides just jumping off a cliff, you know, but that's basically what I talked about. Um, and he was cool enough and rad enough to believe in me and that I had other, other things to offer this sport really in this, in the company of Burton. So, um, I got into a lot of different parts with Burton, uh, some business development, uh, analog and Gravis and channel island surfboards and things like that. Um, and then working in sales and marketing now with, uh, Burton North America. So I'm a little more behind the scenes, but I mean, that transition, you know, I still love, I love snowboarding. It's part of my life. Um, I know about it. I love it. Um, so that's kind of my story. Yeah, it's you, you certainly have the credibility. Mm -hmm. You know, you pretty much went right from pro or from rep to pro, right? There wasn't yeah. much of a transition. Yeah, so Ethan, was like, instant. that was like, you know, we talked about that in the beginning, but like, I was a rep and I understood it. I worked at a snowboard shop, yeah. like, you know, I, and I was a rep. So before he was a pro, so I totally understood that, and Jake knew that, you know, and in really, you know, all through my career, I was really involved with a lot of things like product. I was super involved with the product and the product process and working with product managers. Craig taught me a lot about that, like how to respond to people. He used to like write faxes. You guys probably don't even know what a fax is, but he used to like be at a heli lodge with me and he'd like write these long faxes to like the product managers and stuff. And so being able to communicate my thoughts in my brain to the product um, was something Jake and Craig helped me be more involved in, you know? Um, but then I, I knew the back end, like I knew that people actually buy this stuff. Shops have to actually buy it to sell it to people. Like I knew the process, I know how it works, you know, cause I lived it. And so after pro snowboarding, I'm like, Hey, I understand this process. Let me, let me get involved in it. And a lot of people don't understand that process. Now they yeah, lose I sight mean, of it. Maybe. Well, a lot of pro snowboarders, it's, you know, when you're a professional snowboarder, you're, you're forced to be selfish. Yeah. And you don't even understand that people are buying this stuff. They're like, I just want to look dope. And like, I just want it to be like for me, but people actually have to <laughs> put money on the yeah. table and like buy this thing, you know? So a lot of the pro snowboarders don't understand that. Like the end consumer, like what they really do, you know, it's different than what a pro snowboarder does. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a, that's a great topic. And what I think is fascinating is you basically created your own position or multitude of positions, but that's something that's really cool. You kind of carved a little bit of your own lane, would you say? Yeah, like, like I was kind of saying, like I was involved in different, so like product sales and marketing, I think of it very holistically all together. It's not like it's separate. It's like all the same to me. So that's just how I think. Um, so yeah, I kind of, you know, I'm contracted by Burton. You know, I'm not like an employee, like, I do offend people that I go in their department or whatever sometimes and they're like, whoa, wait a minute. Like, but I just want good things to happen, you know, for not just for Burton, I want in snowboarding in general. Like I just want people to be stoked on it. I want, um, I want people to be able to go to a resort or go in the back or do whatever they're doing and have a great day. That's what ultimately I want because that's what I want. And I know if people do that, they're going to be stoked and they're going to have a great day. You know, so that's all I care about. Well, it's interesting because the way you sell products change over the years. Mm -hmm. You know, shops are changing. Mm -hmm. It's going digital, but that end thing that you just said mm -hmm. always stays the same. You know, mm -hmm. as people are having fun, that's important. Yeah, it's the, gosh, the, the digital thing and the, the way things are so different. But, I mean, sh snowboard shops are awesome. Like, people want to go into a snowboard shop and try things on and talk to people. And, um, you know, obviously people buy things online. That's just how it is these days. But, um there's a multiple way of buying products, you yeah. know, um, but I think snowboard shops are really important. Yeah. Same here. One thing I noticed you guys used to do is, you know, you and Alex had the grass or I don't know if it's still going on, but the grassroots thing where you guys are going around to all the different shops, stoking out everybody. And um, I, I'm just curious, like how much value do you place on those relationships with people? I, I think what, you know, I've always tried to do is just kind of keep it real and, um, you know, whether I'm talking to shop employees or a buyer or whatever it is like, or a consumer for that matter is just keep it real, you know? Um, especially with Burton, like we make a lot of mistakes at Burton. Like, Oh my gosh, it's crazy. But I'm trying to keep it real and keep the sport real too at the same time. Um, but relationships are, are important. Um, obviously I know I have a history 
in snowboarding and in the sport. Um, you know, I, I love talking to people that are just getting into it. Like, I love it. Cause I want them to like not go through what I had to go through, you know, <laughs> like I want them to like learn quicker, uh, have a great, better day. Like their hands not be cold. Like all, all these things that I had to learn, I want them to have a great day. So. And you can speed that up for them, huh? Yeah. You know, um, in like, a lot of the pro snowboarders or just, I should say good snowboarders today, you know, um, they have such great product to ride. There's all kinds of every brand, there's all kinds of great stuff. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Back when we were starting, we had a, there's a, a curb of, uh, a lot of the product wasn't as tight as it could have been. Huh? Yeah. The, all the products really good right now. Yeah. For sure. Everybody's killing yeah. it. Yeah. Now, do you have any advice for people that let's say they're, you know, they want to be a pro snowboarder, but maybe they're like, ah, I just, I can't do cab tens or maybe, or whatever, like advice for getting a job mm -hmm. within the industry or mm -hmm. paving your own lane. Mm -hmm. for that matter. Yeah. I probably think about it a little differently than most people that might be even in the industry that are going to actually pay the bills for people. But how I think of it personally is if you're making snowboarding look really fun and you're an inspiration, you could be a professional snowboarder. You don't, yes. you don't have to be the, the best or the gnarliest or win a contest to do that. So I think you could be marketable and you can sell product and be a good representative of the sport if you're that way, you know? So um, I think there's a lot of avenues you could go, you mm -hmm. know? I mean, like you are saying before, there's so many different avenues now of in snowboarding to be a professional Um and this whole social media thing and the whole digital world is so different now. You know, I, I have a hard time wrapping my head around that part. But mm -hmm. one thing talking to Shannon, she said, uh, you look for kind of gaps where there's there's things missing in snowboarding and you work on that. Do you want to elaborate on that? And do you know what she means? Like you see where there's a void in maybe a snowboard product or a void in an area that can be improved and you put your energy towards it. That's what Shannon yeah. briefed me on. Yeah. Um, I just talked to like a lot of people, um, whether it's uh, kids that work at stores or consumers. And uh, like a lot of them have misconceptions in their brain of like what they're writing. And, you know, they're writing things not really for the right reasons or whatever. So I try to just relate things to them tangibly so they can understand it like that that product's for them and that's what that's for. And this one over here might not be for them and that's okay. So mm -hmm. I, it, maybe that's what she's talking about. Um, but I mean, there's not a lot of holes in product these days as far as like different sizes and shapes of snowboards or boots or fit or feel like there's, there's kind of a little bit for everybody. Mm -hmm. Now one of the more iconic boards over at Burton is, is the custom right? mm -hmm. And you had a big part in, in that board's mm -hmm. development, correct? Yep. How so? Yep. Um, so this is a cool story, actually. Um, I tell it to people sometimes, but I'll tell it to you guys. Um, so this is in, let's see, 94. Summer of 94. Yeah. So um, I'm writing for Burton and Joe Curtis at the time, Jeff Curtis's brother, wrote for for, for Burton, awesome guy. Give him an air horn. He needs one because not a lot of people know who Joe is, but he's epic. Um, yeah, we used to always joke about the Curtis by Curtis. Yeah, you know the deal from <laughs> yeah. Colorado. Yeah. You, dude, he's like he's like Vale Euro there. His brother would yeah. shoot the photo yeah. and he'd shred. Yeah, you got an air horn for Joe? <laughs> there you go, Joe. So anyways, Joe, Joe and I um, kind of – we were talking to Burton at a meeting and they had, there was pro models back then. So that was pro model heyday, right? <clears throat> this is like, everybody has a pro model and everybody's a pro and everybody has a pro model. And they're like, dude, Dave, you pro model. I'm like, no, those things are stupid and blah, blah, blah. Like let's, let's, and Joe is kind of on the same program where like, let's develop a board. Cause like I was riding Terry's board at the time. And I'm like, the board was sick. It was like lighter weight than the air, whatever I was riding. And I'm like, I want a board like that, but, I don't want anybody's name on it. Like, I don't want to write a Terry's board. I want to yeah. write like a, just a blue collar, just board, you know? And so, uh, JG and myself and Joe started talking about things and developing shapes. And, uh, JG went down to New Zealand and I flew down there that summer of 94 with a board bag of like 14 boards that I got shipped from Burton and JG actually broke his leg down there in New Zealand. So he's like wow. laid up in the lodge with a broken leg. And I spent like, I think like nine or 10 days, like, um, just riding a bunch of boards, 
in New Zealand. And at that time in 95, 94, there was nobody snowboarding down there, really. It was so cool. Like, yeah. so cool. Like, people thought I was from another planet. Like, I was <laughs> from California. I'm a snowboarder. And they're just like, whoa. Like, it was so different. Anyways, I come back from that trip with, with the shape that I thought was the best, you know, and we um, basically made that board. And that was the year I moved to Utah and started riding at Brighton. And that was the red uh, Pegasus custom. The first custom. First custom, you know, riding in Brighton and stuff. And that was like TB4 and Transworld Video Magazine and stuff. And wow. and the whole concept of the board was to just be a super universal board. Because like Joe's doing half pipe contests. I'm, you know, riding the backcountry. You know, I want a board that I can like hit jibs at Bear Mountain on. I wanted this all this stuff. So we wanted a pretty universal snowboard that you could just have one board to do it on. Uh, but we didn't want anybody's name on it. And we didn't want any, we didn't want any Burton branding on it. That was like a big thing. That was a big fight. But we came up with the graphics that were just um, no branding, really. You know, wow. like on the what, bases. What's and the stuff. logic behind that? I just think it's kind of irrelevant. You know, like I just didn't really. I don't care if it just says like the brand's name on the bottom. To me, that's just kind of like a bumper sticker, and I didn't really care. But um, and a lot of consumers probably felt the same way. Yeah, I think it resonated with a lot of people and it was like, they were, you know, graphics for what were really important. So uh, JDK was a graphic um, company that worked for Burton, did a lot of marketing stuff at, at that time. And they were really involved with me and Joe with the graphics for like, you know, the last next eight years or whatever. But graphics are important. Board still on the line? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Burton Customs, it hasn't really changed, really, yeah. which is crazy. It's like 25 years old, at least, it's or whatever. It's a heavy right? seller, right? And everybody rides it, and it's, it's just a really good, solid snowboard. You know, if people just want a snowboard, it's a go-to, you know? Yeah, um, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Imagine, have you gotten royalties for that for this past uh, yeah. 12 years or that, however that long didn't, it's That been. didn't happen, yeah. but... <laughs> But it, it's hey, just a blue collar board, yeah. Back, though, yeah. So. No, it's just a it's just a good board that you know it was the anti pro snowboarder model. Cool. So I want to highlight something you just said. Uh, mm -hmm. Graphics are important. Mm -hmm. You want to elaborate on that? Well, they're really important. You know, a lot of people buy a board off a of graphic. They're going to just buy it, even though it's the wrong board for them. They just buy it. You know, and they're probably going to have a decent time snowboarding, but they could have a better time if they, you know, had the right board for them. Um, you know, it's a bummer that boards are the way they are. It just kind of, I don't know how to get out of it, but you know, surfboards are white and <laughs> they're just all white. So it's not a graphic thing. It's like how the board rides and feels and stuff. Oh yeah. But snowboards are a graphic and people are like, dude, that board's sick. And I, they look so killer under my arm. I'm just so stoked walking through the parking lot with this they board. Identify you know? like, they identify part. with it. Yeah. Right. And it's a graphic thing. You know, um, I, I find a, a lot of uh, women really, buy a board for sure off a graphic you know a lot of times when i'm in a store or whatever i'm talking to a woman that's looking at a board i just go which one do you like you know and and i make her kind of pick out the one she, i love this one i'm like okay now tell me what you do in snowboarding how do you snowboard what do you what's your favorite day what, what do you have a board now i ask her all these questions and i'm like oh that board will work for you or i'm like no that board's gonna kick your ass yeah mm -hmm. you know so but the graphic is a big deal it's still even a big deal for me you know like for for somebody who's been in it for a long time, like I want a board that looks good. I don't want to walk, yeah. walk around with a board that looks like lame, you know? So yeah, if the graphic I, sucks, you're going to, yeah, not, graphics are important. Right. I'm, yeah. I'm really curious about this. Cause with, with Solomon, we mm -hmm. like would always, I did graphics for a number of years mm -hmm. with boards and, yeah. and there would always be the same argument with the custom. Yeah. My logic was, and maybe this is niche with skateboarder. Mm -hmm. Skateboards are a smaller purchase. You buy more of them. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's more disposable mm -hmm. than a snowboard. So there's more at stake. It's more expensive, mm -hmm. but there'd be this constant argument where I'd be like, I want this kind of cool hand-drawn base graphic that looks like a mm -hmm. skateboard that doesn't look as maybe mm -hmm. corporate would be a word mm -hmm. I'd use. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, the argument of like, well, no, it needs to say, it needs to say Solomon in big mm -hmm. letters. Mm -hmm. now, then that comes from the reps and the sales team. Mm -hmm. And, just out of curios sheer curiosity, like, mm -hmm. why is that? It's the brand, you know? So, like, it's not your company. Yeah. Right? It's right. like, it's like Burns not my company. So, if they make decisions, it's not my, it's not my company. It's not my name on the thing. So, yes. if I wanted to make those ultimate decisions, I would have to start a company. Yes. If I needed to do that. So, it kind of goes in hand in hand, you know, with you or, or with any graphic or whatever. Um, but I think a smart company would, like, listen to snowboarders. And, and listen to them, you know, and uh, sometimes you got to just go with it. And especially a pro model, it's like, it's your name on it. Dude. If you don't want to make any money, then like 
cool. Put your put whatever on it. It's not going to sell, but you well, know. there's there's this funny there's this funny dynamic in behind the scenes with almost yeah. every snowboard company totally. where there's marketing and totally. sales, totally. and sales wants what's safe because yep. they know like okay, this graphic is I'll definitely sell. And marketing, I almost feel like doesn't it's more of like emotional or maybe like mm -hmm. it's more like i think this mm -hmm. is gonna hit but you don't know so there's mm -hmm. that always that for sure that pull and, and for sure. push right sales are a lot, a lot of times they're they're looking in the past they're like yeah this sold before mm -hmm. let's ask the retailers what's gonna sell and so they're looking at what's sold but the product people are looking three years out so like it's a, it's a really hard dynamic sales people most of the time are looking in the past and then product people are looking in the future so that's kind of what I said. When I think of snowboarding, I think of it holistically, product sales and marketing, it's all one thing. And you got to look out and you got to look back and you got to look in the present and you kind of got to tie it all together, you know? Well, it's funny with, you say with graphics and base graphics, like the top five board brands all have very identical, identi like easy to identify mm -hmm. base graphics mm -hmm. and you can identify which brand they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From Burton to mm -hmm. Solomon to yep. Never Summer to Capita, and then it's you know comes down that big graphic, and it's yep. like you know that's a Burton, you know this is a Capita. Well, with contests and the Olympics and a lot of things, it's like there's straight up like you want your name on the like even Jake. Yeah. That, I remember him just going, dude, if my board's on the podium at the Olympics, you want your it name. needs to say my middle name on it, dude. Yeah, right. And I understand that. Yeah, it I makes totally sense. get it. Like you know. So that's important to have your brand name on it. It's know? the only thing in the Olympics you can also even mm -hmm. get a yeah, logo uh, on. Right. Get the logo outer totally. Right. Totally. So that's important for mm -hmm. sure. Uh, let's talk about your best story with Jake Burton because I know you spent some time together. <sighs> Definitely this one time we were, we were at a sales meeting and uh, it was in New Zealand. And I don't I forget the year, but we're, we're in New Zealand at a sales meeting and... I remember he came up to me, kind of with me. He's like, "Hey, dude, do you want to go surfing tomorrow? The waves are gonna be good." I'm like, "Yeah, what are you talking about?" He's like, "I'll, I'll, I'll arrange everything." You know, I go, "I don't have a wetsuit or board." He's like, "I got it, I got it, I got it." You know, I'm like, "Okay, cool." So we meet the next morning, like 7 a.m. Go around the back, and there's a helicopter there with like, <laughs> dude, seriously, we strap snowboards to one side of the helicopter, strap snowboards to the other side of the helicopter, and we get in this helicopter. And it was me and Wes, who's a uh, was the rep at the time in Australia. And Jake and we fly, dude, we fly like 30 minutes in New Zealand through this river valley and we end up on this beach, dude. And there's this huge bay and there's nobody around for like 50, 60 miles or something. And the waves are going off. It's like eight foot, 10 foot. So I'm like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? <laughs> and we end up surfing for like two hours. It was insane. Just the three of us. Nobody else around. The heli's like on the beach on these rocks and stuff. And we're like, this is crazy. I remember Jake broke his leash and he got worked and... Anyways, we, we were on the beach we're like, this is insane. And, and, uh, and we like, <laughs> we literally take our wetsuits off or change it and we eat like a sandwich and okay, like, hey, let's go snowboarding now. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah. <laughs> and we fly up the beach, dude. Seriously, this is real. In a helicopter along the beach for like, like 45 minutes up to near Wanaka. And then we go up in the mountains and we landed in this thing and we changed our clothes and our snowboarding gear and we went and took like sick heli runs, dude, in, in the sickest conditions. It was epic. It was like sunny. We were just riding power, like, and then, uh, and then we're flying back along the mountain range back to uh, where we were staying for the sales meeting in uh, Queenstown. And we're flying along the mountain range, and Jake's got headphones on like this, and he's like, "Hey," he like tells the heli pilot, "Like, hey, I gotta take a piss." And so like the guy like lands on this peak, like a knife edge peak, and Jake gets out. And I remember me and Wes were just in the heli going, this is crazy. Jake gets out and walks away. You know, it's the sun's going down and Jake's just peeing, dude. And we're like, is this for real, dude? And then, and he gets back in the heli. He's like, puts his headphones on. Like, oh, that was the best piss I've ever had in my life. And we, we just fly to the sales meeting. I mean. Every, was everyone else in the sales meeting Yeah, they didn't know what time? happened. They, yeah. they were like, where's Dave? Where's Jake, dude? Like, you know, like. You guys just got shoulder tap to go. He, and, does, he did that a lot. And that was one of the best shoulder taps for sure. Wow. But. He was really into that, like shoulder tap, like yeah, hey, like kick hey, certain like, people, and you know, like <laughs> and uh, off. yeah, 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 totally, totally. But he, um, that's how he lived his life, you know, was um, was like that, and, and his generosity. So mm -hmm. that's killer, and mm -hmm. it's it's uh, it's pretty cool to see his legacy with the Burton Burton boards everywhere. You know, you look around and. He's had a, a gigantic impact mm -hmm. on the sport. Mm -hmm. He he did. I mean, he does for sure. Like, uh, 
the sport is different than, you know, he imagined it, I think, even. You know, I know he knew he believed in it as a sport, and that's what he really brought to the the sport, is he believed that it was an actual real thing, and you could sell it, and people would do it, and that people would actually go to ski resorts and take the chairlift up and come down. Like, that's what he believed. But I think even this, what it is today, is something he never imagined. Yeah, that's cool to think yeah. about. Mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah, because back then, it was, nobody rode a ski resort yeah. or a snowboard. You weren't even allowed to, so... It's cool to see how it changed, you know? See how it changed. Mm-hmm. Give him the super air horn. When you get back from a sales meeting mission like that, are you supposed to not tell everyone where you were, or does he want you to hype it up? No, he, he would he would let us talk about it, you yeah. know? People would kind of know, where'd you guys go? And like I'm like, I don't even know if I want to tell you. Because <laughs> yeah, everyone's there. Yeah, totally. Stuck totally. at the sales meeting. Yeah, 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 for sure. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, we have a, we've got a Seattle slew of guest questions. Oh, that's uh, right. Yeah, everybody's been been uh, reaching out. But I got one uh, I got one from Alex Andrews here. Yeah. Um, and yeah, again, uh, mentoree. I'm not sure if that's a word of yours. Here we go. I got a question for you. I've gotten to know you really well over the past 10 years or so. And from what I've seen, you've been absolutely nailing it at life for decades now. And you're an amazing husband, father, snowboarder, surfer, fisherman. The list goes on. I was hoping you could give us listeners some tips on how to maintain such a lifestyle. It's really <laughs> inspiring and I'd love to hear your answer. Wow. Um, I don't know. I just be honest and and true to what you're, you're doing. Um, love others, you know? Um, I mean, that's the short answer. Um, be passionate about things, get up and stand on your feet and do it, you know? Um, don't just sit down and some sometimes I have a fault at that. Like I just get up and do it. Like I don't think about it. I just let's do it. Okay, let's do it. You know, I just do it, um, and I don't think about it. And sometimes I make mistakes, but that's okay. So don't be afraid to make mistakes in in ways. Um, but uh, yeah, be true true to people that you know you're around. I think anybody, whether it's just a person in line at Starbucks or uh, your your wife or your kids or your friends or you guys or whoever just be true to them and yeah I have a, a incredible story to add to exactly what you're saying uh, I was talking to Jared Winkler who uh, runs marketing over at Brighton good friend yep. of mine yep and he's like I got a date uh, he's like oh you're interviewing Dave today I got a quick story <laughs> for you he's like when I was in high school I was like 15 or 16 or something like that and I drove this old like beat up piece of shit pinto car up to brighton and it basically at the end of the day we were riding all day till the chairlift stopped and there was nobody else in the lot it was an awesome powder day and my truck wouldn't start and then he's like and then dave downing who was a huge pro at the time comes down he was parked right by me and he basically just helped me you know try to get it started ended up cleaning the battery terminals ended up you know, sitting there talking to me, you know, and, and he essentially looked up to you in this huh. huge way huh. and you ended up getting his truck started. And, and then I'm asking him for lift, lift tickets <laughs> like a couple years later. <laughs> but still it's just like, you know, it goes back to what you're That's saying, classic. You, you know, like the, the, he's a little, he's a little <laughs> snot nosed kid that, and you're, you're a big pro and you're still taking the time to talk to that kid and, and, and then look at, look yeah, how, how yeah, the world yeah, works yeah. in this mysterious way. Then you're asking him for it's lifting. So it's funny. And so, I mean, I mean, for me personally, when I <laughs> talk to people like yourself, like when I look at you, it seems like you live a very fulfilling life. You have a great family. You've seemed to navigate through life in, in a great manner. Like you've seemed mm-hmm. just, you, you get to surf, you get to snowboard, you have a family like it and you, you carry yourself in a great way. And like, when I talk to you, like I want to know what Alex is asking. Like I'm the same way. Mm-hmm. I want to deconstruct and know like mm-hmm. what types of things in your life, um, lead, help you lead a fulfilling life mm-hmm. more so than just what tricks you did on the board, but mm-hmm. how, you know, things that are important to you mm-hmm. and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I believe in the Bible, you know, so I, I get a lot of it from reading the Bible. So yeah. a lot of the ways I conduct myself come from from that, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's loving others and um, and doing the right thing. Like, really, it's do the right thing. Like, yeah. whether it's should I drive away from some kid at Brighton that has his car not working and just leave him there? Mm-hmm. Or I do I hope not, right? Or, or do I go over and go, hey, yo, dude, I don't know what to do, and let's figure it out, you know? So. Yeah it kind of comes down to that, you know, just kind of do the right thing. Yeah. I don't know. Um, and, and then going back to that, 
life is also like so much. It's about relationships. It's mm-hmm. about who you know. It's mm-hmm. about connections. And every time you have a good experience with somebody, it opens up a new relationship and yeah. a new avenue. Yeah. And every time you have a bad one, inversely, mm-hmm. it closes that door. Yep. And so it's like it, it really helps you navigate through. Yeah. And it's weird how, you know, each person you meet can and you have a good impact. Yeah. It's just good things keep happening. Yeah, right? it's really pretty simple. You treat treat others as you want to be treated. Yeah. And it's kind of worked out. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? If, if everybody did that, mm-hmm. dude like the crazy world we live in right yes. now is not happening, right? Yeah, It's true. like, if everybody treated others as you'd want to be treated, mm-hmm. we would be in a different space right now. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of the answer to Alex's question, I would say. Yeah, we're you know? so far from that yeah. right now mm-hmm. in society. Yeah. And that sucks. Yeah, so. totally. I just re- revisit, revisited a really easy read uh, called The Four Agreements, um, and it's tiny intro, intro to reading um, if you're looking for a book that along those mm-hmm. lines, but... Uh, Highly recommend it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's all along those exact same things that we're talking about. And, uh, yeah, like I said, it, you know, we had, we had Russell Winfield on here, and, and we were kind of asking him questions in regards to, you know, what, what can we do? What, what do people do to be better? He's like, be a good person. He's yeah. like, you're a good person. Yeah. You're a good yeah. person. You're a good person. Yeah, it's all good. Just focus on being a good person in your own world and, and not and, – mm-hmm. and what what happens is there's a lot of finger pointing, and, and that doesn't seem to <laughs> get anywhere um, – any anywhere in any good directions anytime soon you know mm-hmm. if you're gonna point fingers just point them at yourself yeah there you go because yeah. that's the that's the problem yeah that's how i do it it's like you got uh, i'm the problem you know I'm, you're not the problem i'm the problem so all right buds i think it's time for the bomb hole of the week you're right chris uh this is brought to you by volcom this is about their new patented ZipTech technology. What is ZipTech? Plus? It allows you to connect your jacket to your pants with a zipper. Now, whether you have older outerwear or newer outerwear, it all works together. So why would you want to connect your jacket to your pants, buds? Whether you're pro like Pat Moore or a novice like me, you're going to be out there getting snow into your jacket and pants unless you have this ZipTech technology. It could go up your butt crack, too. It could go or up your, your butt genitals, crack, down your, your butt genitals. crack. Yeah, e- either way. Yeah. The... Uh, the good thing about this, it works with men's, women's, and youth outerwear, and it's patented, and it uh, basically keeps you dry out there and out longer. Keep the elements out of your pantalones is what you're getting That's at. That's basically what so I'm what getting So ca- what kind of giveaway we got going on here? We have a uh, Volcom and Bomb Hole giveaway. The hashtag is Volcom Bomb Proof. Also tag at the Bomb Hole and vo- at Volcom Snow. You're going to get your chance to win a Volcom and Bomb Hole prize pack. Yeah, take- so basically take your best bail uh, upload it onto Instagram and hashtag Volcom Bomb Hole. Volcom Bomb Proof, Chris. Volcom Bomb Proof. <laughs> See, I didn't remember. That's what it is. Hashtag Volcom Bomb Proof. And one of the uh, Volcom riders is going to handpick their favorite bail. So let's get some God, good stuff. I, I love a good bail. Uh, hey, speaking of which, Dave, do you have a favorite bail of your career? Favorite bomb hole, if you will. Favorite or worst? Any memorable. So we're actually, worst. Let's <laughs> that, go that, worst. That TB5 trip to Alaska with Johan and uh, Victoria and Mike Hatchett. It was like I had a near death experience. Um, I I jumped off this cliff and I hit this like uh, submerged rock that was like frozen. Boom! And it, like spun me off the second cliff, and I just flipped off this like forty five foot cliff and I landed next to a rock like literally six inches with my face. Wow! And like if I was six inches to the left, I wouldn't be here right now. So that was my worst. Did that situation? Did that change the trajectory of your career? Like, uh, did that you, one didn't actually. Like I remember, yeah, I got right back on it that afternoon. I had to like did this other line in Alaska, and I had like a black eye and stuff, and I was just like, I had to just ride again. Um, <clears throat> but that was that was a big one for sure. Um, but getting injured does did do some stuff to my brain. I hurt my knee one year and then my ankle another year. And, you know, I kind of would always doubt things. And after I got injured a few times, I kind of started doubting things for you sure. You started realizing you're not a Superman? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hurt a couple yeah, times. yeah, it kind of sucks. But Some well, people go- realize that stuff quick in Alaska and start to veer away from it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I've had some instances that make me turn the volume down on my running. Yeah, turn and, the volume and, and, down and, but, at least. But going back to uh, the the almost land on the rock, you can't mm-hmm. spend too much time in that space of what ifs. It doesn't help. Exactly. It doesn't serve you, you, right? you got to get, just get over it and go again, you know. Um, that was just a situation that, you know, accidents do happen, you know. Um, but, uh, 
you got to learn from your mistakes, you know, but things are going to happen. That's just the way it is. Buds, let's talk about pub beer. Cheap, fun beer, dog. You like uh, you like those things? I love those things, man. Crushing cans. If it's not liquid death, it's going to be pub beer. Absolutely. If you want to support a company that supports the podcast, make sure when you're staring at that, you know, you're in the beer cooler, the uh, ice cave, whatever they call those things, make sure when you got them all lined up, you're going to pick the pub beer. You don't want the PBR. You don't want the Budweiser. You want the pub beer, okay? Don't forget that. And with that, we are going to get into the pub beer crapshoot. Here we go. Welcome to the pub beer crap shoot. Buds, you want to explain what the pub beer crap shoot is? Yeah, basically you're gonna roll two dice, and uh, the number you get is gonna choose your fate on a question brought to you by the good folks at Pub Beer. Oh boy. Okay. Now, um, <laughs> if it lands on Goon Gear, it's a six. Yeah, Goon Gear is a six. These are Goon Gear dice. We got a three and a two. Five. Okay, here's a, it's a would you rather. Would you rather have a tattoo designed by Grenier and tattooed by Eastone or designed by Eastone and tatted by Chris? Hard-hitting question. You look like a gentleman who doesn't have any tattoos. I have no no tats. Neither do I. This would be your first tattoo. The question is, you're designing the tattoo? And he's doing it. And I'm administering it. Or vice versa. (laughs) You're probably a good artist, right? You're a photographer. Yeah, I figured His it out. His handwriting's horrific. <laughs> That's true. That is true. I have bad handwriting. But and I you, And you've done board graphics in the in the past. So I'm going to go with you, Chris, designing the graphic. Wow, I like that. And Ethan. Administering? Yeah. Okay, that's a good answer. Your first tattoo? Yeah. Well, we not. have a tattoo gun. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a lose-lose, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, really it's a kind of a lose-lose. Lose. Yeah, we're both hor- have, uh, we'll horrible We'll just make sure it's really big. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We're going to get into another section we call hot takes here on the show. Uh, you know, things that we frequently ask our guests. And our question number one is who is the Michael Jordan or goat, both male and female, who you got? Alive today. So uh, Terry is probably the goat. Um, I'm going to say my wife, Shannon, is the goat of snowboarding for, or female. So, um, yeah. Great answer. Uh, if you could go hellying with three people, dead or alive, who would it be? I think I answered that. Craig, Noah, and did I say Jake? That's that's what it would be. Mm-hmm. Craig, Noah, and Jake. Yep. Um, what about the beaver slap? If you're in the lift line and uh, you got some snow on your board, you know you some people some people pick up their board oh, yeah. and just whack it on the ground. Oh, are yeah. you a, are, are you a fan? Oh sure, yeah. You guys get the snow off. You know, mm-hmm. lift operators don't like it, but you know. They don't like it. So yeah. you're pro yeah. slap. Mellow beaver slap, like not like an uh, aggressive. Not a big flex. Beaver. Yeah, just like, you know, get the snow off. Yeah. Okay, respect, yeah. respect. Uh, who is the best surfer in snowboarding? E- either that I've surfed with, either Brian Aguchi or Brian Thien. Really? Uh, probably Brian Aguchi. Damn. Brian Thien can surf too. What about Brock Crouch? I, oh, yeah, sorry. That's, you're right. You Brock, see Brock Crouch uh, out in the yeah, line? Yeah, 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 yeah. You see yeah. him out there? He's too young for me to remember about it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, definitely Brock. What about Mark? Hands, Mark? hands down, Brock. What about Mark Mick? Mark can surf, but he surfs like a snowboarder. Brock surfs like a surfer. Like, yeah. there's different. There's a difference. Mm. Brock grew up surfing. Brock grew up surfing. So, yeah. and like, yeah, but Brock for sure. I like to rock like a 26-inch, like, fat stance when I'm, when I'm, uh, Surfing just horrible, Steve. Surfing's hard, dude. It's like I it's super you're hard. To have a pretty big <clears throat> stance. I don't think so. No, you get you move your feet surfing. Like oh, you, you move your feet, feet a lot. Around. Like yeah. your especially your back foot, you kind of move it a lot. Like um, so, you're depending on what you're doing. But so we've seen you ride half pipe, hit park rails, mm-hmm. ride big mountain, mm-hmm. but we never really saw you get too much into the streets. Mm-hmm. Why do you Why do you think that was? Oh, well, probably because I was scared shitless you know (laughs) like um but and and also it was a little weird to me but like i i like it and i was like inspired by it a lot and like i have the utmost respect for people that do that um i did a few handrail trips like a few with mac dog and stuff like that but it was just it was scary like i was way more scared hitting like a kink rail with stairs than i would be jumping off a cliff in the backcountry a 40 foot cliff or something so I was definitely more intimidated by it. Um, I wasn't like a big skater, like street skater. So that's probably a, a reason. Um, and then 
it was just distracting for me. Like when there's snow, I didn't want to like fly to Minnesota. I wanted to go to Canada and ride the mountains. <laughs> so it was probably a little selfish thing too, you know, like I liked it and I, and I, um, I was inspired by, you know, JP and Jeremy and Kevin and dudes, friends of mine that were into it. And I was like, oh, you know, I want to do this. So it wasn't like I was anti at all. I was like, I thought it was great. It's just pretty gnarly. Like, and then just to see how it evolved, that's when I just like, okay. When Jeremy started like jumping and landing off buildings and bud spl- bug splatting and stuff, I was like, okay, that's, that's something I don't want to do, you know, like. It's pretty gnarly to and me. And nowadays, you basically have to focus. Yeah, yeah. Only everything yeah. on that, and yeah. not yeah. everything yeah. specialized. Yeah, yeah. everything specialized. And it got really kind of like I was talking about before. It got really like <sighs> preconceived and stuntish. Like snowboarding became a stunt, and that's when I was like, "This isn't that cool anymore for me." Like I don't know. Like I want to snowboard and i want to make it look good like i said it just for me like the stunt wasn't it you know and that's not what inspired me so that makes sense i don't know i love that that's yeah no, but that's but i get it like i totally understand no, the like the, the adrenaline like jeremy jones like he needs that like in his brain in his soul he needs to like scare the crap out of himself and overcome it and do something well, that, that's what's great about snowboarding. There's no right direction. Mm-hmm. And sure, mm-hmm. it's fun to make fun of other genres, mm-hmm. but really there is no right direction. So totally. when you look at, like, maybe Jeremy wants to go wall splat mm-hmm. and you want to go more Craig Kelly, mm-hmm. and both of those directions mm-hmm. aren't the right directions, right, right. you know, depending on your right. what you're into. For sure, for sure. Like, I mean, even in my career, like Tom Burt, like everybody used to like bag on Tom Burt, like white Varnays. And this is, you know, he's like a skier he's the way he dressed and stuff and the, what he did. And I was like, dude, I've, I ride with Tom Burt. He's gnarly. Like I couldn't even come close to keeping up with him, you know? And a lot of people would just fast forward his video parts. And, and he was a guy that, cause I would go out with him. I'm like, dude, he's like so gnarly, you know, <laughs> like, and they wouldn't even understand it. You know, like if some people that, you know, like Chris, if you rode uh squaw or something with Tom Burt, you'd be like, what is happening like it's a whole different deal you know and Sick. and he's older than i am and he's just and he still rides crazy oh, he's gnarly wow like i can't even come close to keeping up with him wow you know he's just gnarly so there's like you said different genres of snowboarding you know and it's there's no like bad you know i don't think and in kids i see kids like grow up you know something they thought was like uh oh, like even kevin jones like splitboarding's lame blah, blah, blah. you're making fun of me and now he's splitboarding every day yeah. like that's totally cool you know like it changes people change you know and and um you should change that's something too that i find really interesting you know like all the good free riders that i've known in my whole life like noah you know um johan like i was saying they were full freestylers like i was like a full freestyle bear mountain you know brian Gucci. And all of a sudden you get to a point and you're like, oh, dude, I want to ride the mountains. And you kind of go that way naturally. A lot of people do, you know. So a lot of the good, like, free ride people were kind of from a freestyle realm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and even JP, he did some never-been-done tricks before, dude, right, in the mountains. So Before he was even doing handrails, he was yeah. doing so many crazy jumps. I remember seeing him, at, him and Jeremy at Brighton in, like, what was it, 93 or 94. And they are riding, like, rev snowboards back then. And they were doing crazy stuff, yeah, building jumps, filming. and they weren't even filming. Yeah, just for fun, huh? Dude, I was like, well, are you guys filming? Oh, no. Like, you know, I'm like, whoa, you guys are gnarly. I also think even <laughs> on a bigger level, I think it's natural for humans to evolve. Like, mm-hmm. when people, you know, sure. you'll, you'll hear something like, oh, man, you've changed. You mm-hmm. know, even, even Alex says that to me, because mm-hmm. I, I used to get super fucked up. But that's good, and, dude. And I mean, the, hats yeah, off to you. That's killer. Totally. Like, Because, I, you know, I'll, I'll do yoga or things I would totally make fun of myself for, like, five years ago, right? Yeah, yep. And But people are like, hey, you've, you've changed. You and, and it's like... Dude, well, good. I, I don't want to be the same person I was when exactly, I was 18. Exactly. Right. And if that means like I'm going to be making fun of splitboarding and then doing it three years later, that's okay. That's my pattern. Yeah, yeah, I do yeah, that yeah, with yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do that with mountain biking. I do it too. I do it all the time. You know, like, like if you're not changing, you're not growing. You know. So yeah, it's true. I yeah. agree. I agree with that for sure. Yeah, I don't think that should be looked as as a bad thing. And and as far as you know, all of us, I think we care about the fabric of this. We'll call it a sport for the sake of conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think? You know, what are some things that would be helpful for improving, getting people into it, um, and growing the culture? Do you have any any thoughts on that subject with Burton? I know you guys probably are in that world a little bit. Yeah, um, I mean the 
the ease of entry is very difficult, you know, for a lot of people, whether it's just logistics on getting to the mountain or the price of lift tickets or a pass, you know, there are things that, you know, icon pass and things like that are making things easier, but just the ease of entry, you know, um, just, I wish there was a better way like in the U S for that matter to like have, uh, inexpensive ski resorts it's just not a thing like in japan dude lift tickets are like 40 bucks and like the food's killer and it's cheap it's just because the government makes it easy for them to like have a ski resort like there's like 450 ski resorts in japan and they're all epic um so i think the ease of entry is the answer to the question mm-hmm. you know um and you know a lot of people live in urban places and for them to get to a, a mountain resort it's mostly vacation that's what snowboarding is or skiing for that matter. It's a vacation, you know, for a lot of Americans. Um, and that's cool too, but like to do it a lot and to be super into it, you got to live near it. You got to live a place like this great place like Salt Lake city where you can access it within 20 minutes. And you know, it's a different part of the culture than it is if you're living in LA or San Diego or, you know, it's hard to get to a place, you know, you're right. Making it, making it a culture rather than a vacation is, Mm -hmm. is a a lifestyle, Mm -hmm. I should say, Mm -hmm. rather than, you know, a lot of people that sit in that chair, their dads are lifty Mm -hmm. or they're working ski patrol or whatever, you know, like people that are raised by the ski resort Mm -hmm. tend to, to make a lifestyle out of it. And Mm -hmm. and that's what we do and what we've, we've done, but like making that, you know, more Mm -hmm. attainable for the general public Mm -hmm. to get to that point to want, I mean, Mm -hmm. anybody can do it, Mm -hmm. but you have to build your life around it and and catch that bug at a right, at a young age. But I know a lot of people that, you know, they have great careers and they have things. And when they snowboard, they get after it. Like they're like, I'm going to bald face. I'm going to this trip and I'm going to ride hard for like 10 days, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's what snowboarding is to them. Yeah. You know, and they have a career and a family and all these things. Um, but snowboarding is something that you can do like that, which is super cool. Like surfing, you can't, it's really hard to do that because you got to be in surf shape and all these things, but snowboarding, you just go and do it, Yep. which is so sick, you know? I didn't realize that about Japan too, what you're saying about cheap lift tickets and accessibility. Yeah, it's so sick. And there's a crazy stat. So like Japan's like roughly the size of California, right? Yeah. And there's more ski resorts in Japan than there is in all of North America. That's crazy. So imagine that. Including Canada. Including, so imagine all the ski resorts in Canada and the United States put into California. That is crazy stat. Well, they get, and they get, that's s- pretty nuts. Yeah. yeah. They get so much snow there too. It makes, it makes sense. And yeah. But the, the other thing to think about too is like from a, you know, mental health standpoint, mm-hmm. if you're, if you live in an area that gets a shitload of snow mm-hmm. and you don't fucking play hockey or ski or mm-hmm. snowboard or do have, have a winter sport activity like, it's your hard. odds of getting depressed have to be so mm. much goddamn higher. Like, yeah, you know, hard. it's, it's like just like, it's almost from, from a, from a human just happiness standpoint. Yeah. And it's a complex conversation cause it's yeah. so expensive. Yeah. And so you, it's easy to say when you have money in your bank account, like, yeah, just go snowboarding. Well, not, not everybody. But has in the, those. in the Midwest and stuff, it's, you know, it, it doesn't cost that much and you can go, you know, ride for 30, 40 minutes or an hour or two after work or whatever, like in you know, the mountains are that big, but at least you can go take some laps and like you said, get some fresh air and have a good day mm-hmm. yeah full mind sh- mindset yeah. shift you're yeah, having a bad day shift. you get up in the mountains you go on even get ride some rails on a rope toe boom okay well let's <laughs> transition into uh one thing we always like to ask our guests is uh what setup snowboard are you currently riding um our audience loves to know you know what what you ride what you'd recommend to ride what your setup is angles how you set up your board all that good stuff mm-hmm. um right now yeah. like I, I have a few different boards and stuff, but um, are you a quiver guy? I'm a full quiver guy. Oh, for you believe sure. in the quiver? Oh, he's a quiver. Some people quiver don't guy. believe in the quiver. Yeah, I used to like not because there wasn't such a real thing, you know. That's why the custom was what it was, right? Yeah. It was like I wanted one board to do everything, um, and I rode different sizes and stuff for different occasions. Mm-hmm. Um, like I would ride like a 52 custom on like jibs and stuff, and then I'd ride a 58 or 62 in the backcountry kind of thing. But the 50 or the 62 custom. Yeah. 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 But now I ride, you know, a lot of like tapered boards. Like my favorite board if you, is, a, it's called the Power Wrench and it's 50, it's a 152. And I would take that anywhere in the world and ride. I'd really? take it to Alaska, take it to anywhere. So, and that's a 52, but it has 20 millimeters of taper. It's like a, a shaped board, but I have the most fun on that board, you know, for, for me 
It's um, probably way in the back seat, huh? It's a shorter tail for sure. It's tapered, so you know it has a wider nose and tail. So the nose floats and the nose tail floats. sinks. Tapered boards for people that are listening, it's it's the the width in the front of the board is wider than the tail. So naturally it's gonna float in powder. And um, turn well. And turn easy. well. It enters and exit a turn like I was talking about really easy because it's it's wider as you enter and you exit on the tail. It's just feels good you know yeah when those came out mm -hmm. they just changed yeah. life for me yeah. with a big backpack for sure you know? right you're carrying stuff and it just made it more comfortable and easy to ride powder and that's what i like to do um but i like shaped boards you know i, I like direction i rarely ride a twin anymore if i go to bear with my kids i'll ride a twin or something like that but i'm not like getting crazy on rails anymore um but I don't ride twins hardly at all i ride mostly directional boards um my stance um it's 23 inches, 18 in the front. It's always been 18 in the front. I ride positive three in the back. Oh, posy, posy guy. Mm -hmm. Posy, posy. Yeah, for sure. I, I can't really turn without that. If I have a duck stance, I can't really turn, especially heel turn or in the steeps or anything. So I've always just kind of rode positive. I, sometimes I would ride like negative three or something like that. Uh, That's what the, I do. At Bear Mountain, three. you know, I'd either be negative three on, on like a full like jib board kind of thing, or I'd be like positive three. Um, yeah. And I've been riding no straps for like over, over four years. I ride that step on system with Burton. Oh, you do. I really enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, forward lean. Yep. I ride You can, for, you can forward do forward lean. lean on the step ons. Yep. Yep. Okay. Cause it built into the high back. Yeah. It's just in the high back. You just two little screws. Oh, you just kind of like, you know, you guys call it strapless now, huh? You know, yeah, I don't know what they call it. You know, it's, <laughs> it's it's step on, but it's strapless. It's uh, uh yeah, I, I like it. It's comfortable. You want to explain a lot what it is to the people that it's don't just know what a it is? a binding system that doesn't have straps. You know, you, they took the straps off and connected you to the binding from the heel cup. So instead of using the strap to like ratchet your heel into the heel cup of the binding, they took the straps off and just connected you to the high back pretty much so and it's still a comfortable boot to walk it's, around in? yeah it's the same boot as we make you know basically oh really it's the same deal it's so it's there's no metal sh under your foot it's it's pretty killer like i didn't think i'd be riding does dude. jeremy like, jones give you shit for riding that everybody gives me shit but, <laughs> um, but but like i like it it just you know like i don't know like i, I rode the step in stuff like in the 90s and mm -hmm. had to deal with that stuff and it was mm -hmm. horrible because you're attached under your foot and you're trying to like turn a snowboard being attached under the bottom of your mm -hmm. foot and it just didn't work, you know, but yeah. once they attached you to the high back and like the way it is, it's just like, there's so much power and for what I like to do, you know, yeah. like freestyle kids probably wouldn't like it. If you're yeah. just like spinning cab nines upside down and getting crazy because you want like a 360 degree, like looser feel. Yeah. But if you're riding, it's sick. So that I like, riding do you them. think it's going <laughs> to like take, like really catch, catch on where people are going to like start using it a lot. What do you see the future for that? It's a good question. I mean, it already is. Like, it's it's it sells really well. So oh, it's, it's already it. caught on, okay. you know. But um, I see it growing for sure. You know, other brands doing it and stuff like that. I mean, as you get older, it's harder just to strap in. And when I, see, when I see people learn on it, dude, it's just like, oh, my yeah. God. Like, it's cheating when you're learning because you don't have to sit down and strap. Like, you see people, like, sitting there and, you know, you've seen they it. They can't it's, figure out how to get up properly. It just sucks, dude. Like, yeah. but they don't. People that learn, you just get off the chairlift and go over there and just put your foot in it and go down. And it's on. So it's pretty easy to learn, you know. So a good, a good thing for barrier to entry. The, yeah. That ease of entry, that's a big part of it for sure. Good yeah. for ease of entry, bad because you're going to get made fun of by your Jamie yeah. Thomas friends. rocks it. Yeah. Oh, he does. Yeah. Is he? Yeah. Remember, yeah. he came on and was yeah. talking about yeah. how Jeremy makes fun of him, but he doesn't care <laughs> because he can just keep up with his kids and strap yeah. in fast. Yeah, yeah, totally. Doesn't have to sit there yeah. and figure shit out. Jeremy makes fun of me of anything I do, so it's like. Ah, that's I'm, a good friend. That's I'm, what a good, I'm that's used what a to it. Friend. That's what I'm good friends do. They good friends do it to right to your face. I'm used to <laughs> it. Um, okay. Well, I think it's been a great. I got combo. one quick Patreon yeah. question Hit that it. I think Hit a it. lot of people might want to hear. This Hit is it. from Andy Hotling. Mm -hmm. What's your advice to continue to push yourself and enjoy riding at a high level as we get older? <sighs> like, I think I can snowboard till I'm pretty old. You know, eighty or whatever. Um, if your mind and your, if you keep your body in shape, doing what at working out doing another sport is, and then when you snowboard, um, stretch, you know, ride a bike, flush the lactic acid out of your system, things like that. But, um, you can get better at snowboarding. Kind of like I was saying, just cause you're older, that doesn't snowboarding doesn't need to be spinning and jumping onto rails. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, like good snowboarding can be done on a groomed run or in powder or whatever you want it to be. 
you know, so it doesn't have to end. Um, just because you're older, I'm 53, you know, and I love snowboarding. Like I can't snowboard 30 days in a row without a break, you know, I'm buckled, but I still love it. You know, I still ride a lot, you know, like last year was so epic. Like I had a great year, you know, I rode a lot in Tahoe, was super stoked. So. Yeah. I always feel like powder is like riding a bike. You never really lose that, but jumping, it just yeah. gets farther away. Yeah. Grabs get harder. Speeds yeah. get harder. Yeah, yeah, totally. But why grab your board? You're attached to it, so like there you go. You know, <laughs> <laughs> we're going MFM you don't need over to grab here. It, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, it's well, fun. It feels good to grab your board, though. But <laughs> <clears throat> well, that's a money answer. Uh, do you have any thank yous you want to hit before we wrap this thing up? Oh, no, just thank you guys and thanks for you know representing snowboarding in a great way and uh, keeping it real. Love it. Much appreciated, Dave. And thank you guys for listening, supporting the bomb hold to all our Patreon members, all of our sponsors. Thank you guys so much. We will see you next week over and out from the bomb hole.